Okay. Great. Um, I'm Harman Zuckerman. I'm calling the planning board meeting for the planning board of the city of Boulder to order at 6.02 p.m. on July the 30th, 2020. And I'm gonna, as a first order of business, turn it over to Jean Gatza, who is going to take care of some of the housekeeping and procedural items for tonight's webinar on Zoom. Thank you, Jean. Great, thank you, Harmon. Um, hello, everybody. We're in a little bit different format than we've had for planning board meetings um, before. We're actually using a Zoom webinar. So um, what that means is that um, the board members as co-hosts can see the um, folks that are panelists and attendees will be making, um, that we know we have a number of folks that are applicants tonight, we'll be promoting you to panelists so that you'll be able to control your um, your microphone and your video. We're gonna ask you that um, you keep your video and your microphone off until it's time for you, for um, your item. Um, for the other folks that are in attendee mode, um, you'll be, what we'll be doing with the public hearing is that you'll use the um, raise hand button that you should see if you just hover over the lower part of your screen. Um, and that's when we get to eat either the open comment or the public hearing, you'll use that raise hand function and then I'll be able to call on you and ask you to unmute. Um, we will not be um, using video for any of the um, public comment periods, um, the timing because of our rules, which Cindy will go through in just a minute. There is also a chat function that, that um, we have and it says that the messaging goes to all panelists the panelists are not, um, the board members and, the, and um, applicants are not monitoring the chat function. The chat function for this meeting is really only to communicate with me as the host if you have a technical issue. Um, and I think with that, um, Cindy, shall we do the, um, the other rules? Do you want me to, just to um, share screen? Sure, that'd be great, thank you. Okay. All right. Great, can you see that? Not quite yet. Yeah. Okay. There so we go. There I we got go. it now. Great, just so, let me know when to. Yes, uh, welcome to the planning board. These are the rules of decorum that we have um, voted and uh, approved. Uh, for all of our virtual meetings. Um, we've gone over them at each and every meeting, but it is standard procedure that we do this each meeting. Um, we like to strike a balance between meaningful and transparent engagement and online securities. That is the reason we have these rules of decorum. This meeting has been called to conduct business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, dis delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. Um, no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding and no person shall speak long for longer than the time allotted. Uh, for public speaking, that is usually three minutes. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. That's why we've been asking people's names who come onto this meeting with a pseudonym or I do see someone who has come on with just a phone number, so we will be asking for your full name. Uh, Jean, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, no, video. <laughs> no video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. Um, all others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these roles, which will be either Jean or Harmon, uh, by muting anyone who violates any rule. If the chat function is enabled, which it is in this case uh, for this meeting, it is used for individuals, which would be our public, uh, to communicate with our host, which is Jean. Um, it should be used for technical and online platform related questions only. Um, the board will not be looking at chat and should not be looking at chat, meaning please don't relate any of your feelings or questions in chat because those are not going to be looked at by the board. 
and we res the city reserves the right to disable that individual's access to chat if it's violated. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. Thank you. Okay, and for, um, for folks that are on the phone when we get to the public comment or the public hearings, you will be able to let me know that to, to raise hand using the star nine function. And you'll be able to um, mute and unmute yourself using the star six function. So uh, when we get there, that's what we can do for, the, for folks that are on the phone. Okay. Harmon, did we forget anything? So I, I think, Gene, that in this mode, there's no way for co-hosts to raise hands. Is that correct? There is not. Okay, yeah, so you, for, guys, for you guys have the, you are able to control your own muting and unmuting. Right, but for, for my fellow planning board members, since you're not gonna be able to raise your hand to let me know you wanna speak, we're just gonna have to make do and raise your hand uh, and I'll try to see who's raising their hands. Uh, with my eyes. Okay. Um, Gina, anything else or shall I take it away? I think that's, I think that's it. Um, if you, you'll, you can go through the approval of the minutes and then um, hand it back to me for the public participation. Okay, very good. Okay, so we have um, two sets of minutes to approve as a second item on our agenda and we'll just do them one at a time. Um, so first, just to uh, confirm, um, Cindy, you've made all the changes that were forwarded to you by board members. And these are the most recent versions. Thank you. Let the record show she nodded yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, that's okay. We can take care of it. And uh, so I'm going to call for uh, a motion for approval for the June 25th, 2020 minutes. Anyone, anyone want to make a motion? John Gershaw? I'll move to approve them. Second. Peter Vitale is making a second motion. Uh, call for a roll call vote. David Ensign? Aye. Sarah Silver? Aye. John Gerstel? Yes. Lupita Montoya? Aye. Peter Vitale? Aye. And Harmon Zuckerman? Aye. Uh, so we have a unanimous vote with six. Uh, oh, Lisa Smith is here. Can I am, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm fighting some uh, internet connectivity, but when I cut the um, video out, it seems to work. I'm also an I. Okay, great. So we have uh, all seven of us. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, let's move on to the um, July 6, 2020 retreat minutes. Um, let me uh, call for a motion for approval. I'll move to approve them. Thanks, John. Uh, motion by Gerstel, second. I'll second. Second by Ensign. Uh, take a roll call vote, Ensign. Uh, aye. Sarah Silver? Aye. John Gerstel? Yes. Lupita Montoya? Yes. Peter Vitale? Aye. And Lisa Smith? Aye. All right, and I'll say aye. So we've approved the Ju July 6, 2020 minutes. Um, next item is public participation. And this item <laughs> is the third item on the agenda. And what it's for, <laughs> is for members of the public to address the planning board on items that are not on our public hearing agenda for tonight. And we have two members on our two items on our public hearing agenda. Um, the first one is uh, consideration of the 2150 Folsom subdivision. And the second is a public hearing and consideration of a site review for 1750 15th Street and 1680 Canyon Boulevard, which is the Liquor Mart. Um, site. So if, uh, if you want to speak to either of those two items, please hold your comments until the public hearing for uh, the appropriate one of those two items, or both if you want to speak to both. But, uh, but for now, this public participation is just on general matters for the board. So thank you, Jean. I'll let you handle it from this point. Yes, again, so um, we will be using the raise hand function that if you hover at the bottom of your screen as an attendee and hit that button to speak, um, it'll show up for, for me to be able to note that you would like to speak in the general public hearing. Um, for anyone on the phone, you can press 
star nine to raise your hand at this point for overall general comments. Um, I know this is a little weird, a little different um, format. We can't, uh, as an attendee, you can't see uh, who else in the meeting, but um, right for right now, we have about 25 attendees and we have 20, 20, member, 20 um, panelists who are the board members and staff members. So um, if we were all in council chambers, so it would be a pretty full room. All right. Um, I saw a hand for a moment. And now I don't. Um, Lynn, I think you had your hand up. Um, yeah, to raise hands. So I'm going to, um, Cindy, can you display the, the um, timer? Yes, I sure can. Okay, so it's three minutes um, to speak. And Lynn, I just hit the button for allow to talk. So you should be able to unmute yourself. And you can go ahead. Yeah, Harmon, Lisa's not going to be able to raise her hand because her video's off. So what's she going to do? I'm able to speak, Lynn. So don't worry about me. No, she, but you're supposed to be able to raise your hand. Harmon said that before you came on because that's the only way he can find out. So Harmon, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> Nothing, I guess. Lisa can probably interrupt a bit, just like, I, just like I'm doing. if you have a question. Got that? I guess I have to run the meeting in, in lieu of Carmen. I think Lisa is capable of saying yes or no without her hand raised. Yeah, she can speak. You interrupt the process and you want to know that somebody could do that if their video is off. If they go to the bathroom and they leave, you know, I just need to consider it. Um, you need to Lynn, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you um, be close to the microphone? Thanks a lot, Jean, because I like to know that the feedback's very important in these virtual times. Um, you need to un-annex gun barrel. We need to get gun barrel out of the city of Boulder. And I'm sure that the gun barrel community would be happy to do that because it, it's not an opportunistic event anymore like it was when we originally set up the flagpole annexation out there. Um, 1729 Pearl. Um, the, the, that, that project needs to be reversed. Um, we need to preserve commercial and service opportunities for Boulder. I should not say what you shouldn't be doing because there's plenty that I have to say about that, but what you should be doing in this planning board is promoting repurposing of our existing built environment because we just lost 33% of our whole economy. I don't know if you heard that today in the first quarter of, of this year. So, you know, this is like a kind of crisis and build, 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 like with all of these projects is, is not an option anymore. What is a good option is to repurpose the, you know, the, the architectural and the contracting and building community to relearn how to, how to use what we have and repurpose it because that's what we need to be doing. Um, for example, there's 700 seats in the Fox Theater, only 37 of those seats can actually be used. Um, and this, we have to assume this is, this is the future. This is our life. This is the way we behave because we build all these things and, that are new now, like at 15th, the, the eating place, um, at 15th and Pearl. And what's it for? It was designed probably for people being closer than six feet um, between them. So it's not functional anymore. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, I tried to get on to the East Boulder um, sub-community working group on the 22nd and was directed that it would be the 25th. So I couldn't even get on. Um, so we can't let democracy fall through when people are just trying to participate. Um, Thanks, Lynn. Could you wrap up, please? Yeah. Um, I think this conflict of interest issue needs to be much more open. When Harmon, when you have an association with um, Coburn in the county somewhere, that association 
includes itself to a project you might be doing in Boulder. And that needs to be considered. If you're, if that's not, you know, considered a conflict of interest, great. But it should be known that that's happening. And I've seen people with a lot less, like Bob Yates just had a couple shares, mm -hmm. a few in Hain, and recused himself from Gun Barrel as a result. So it needs to be a spectrum of how close your association with and it's not just that you aren't directly Please. getting gain, it's that you have an association and it's a, a compatible one or you're working on other projects in other places. And that okay. seemed to me to be a conflict of interest, but I'm not the expert. I'm not a legal expert. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing <coughs> other um, folks with a raised hand to speak in the um, general public hearing. And um, I will just say to remind folks, um, if you are wanting to speak in the public hearings coming up, um, as Cindy mentioned, we're gonna ask you to use, your, use a full name. So it um, looks like we've got a couple folks that still have just a, a first name or, um, uh, or a, a, something that doesn't look, look like, quite like a name. So um, if you would like to speak in the public hearing, um, you can slide over your name and um, do the rename function, or if you want to send me a chat, I'm happy to help you with renaming. Okay, thank you. Harmon, I think I'm back to you. All right, thanks. Okay, so with public participation complete, um, we're going to go to a discussion of dispositions, planning board call-ups, and continuations. Today, we only have one item under this matter for in our agenda. It's a call up item. Uh, it's a use review for the addition of 94 square feet of floor area for a stair access to a new roof deck planned for property tenants on an existing single story office building. The existing site is non conforming as to parking and parking demand does not increase with the proposal. The decision may be called up before planning board honor before July 31st, 2020 tomorrow. Uh, is there anyone on planning board who would like to call this matter up tonight? I see Sarah's I hand up. Yeah, I don't want to call it up. I just have a question, which Go has ahead. to do um, the uh, good neighbor agreement that the uh, deck would only be used from seven in the morning till eight at night. If the, re if the residents in the neighborhood conclude a few months from now that they'd prefer a different time frame, can that be revisited? Well, the approval will be for the management plan that's in place. If they find that there's a violation of it, um, it's of course a complaint based, so our code enforcement would look into it, but uh, it is approving the 7 to 8 p.m. Yeah, I wasn't so much concerned about complaints as much as if the neighbors discover that 7 a.m. turns out to be um, too too disruptive. Is that something that can come back uh, through use? What would be the process by which the neighbors could, if they wanted to, um, review that with the management? Well, um, the um, property owner has been pretty receptive to receiving comments from neighbors and held a good neighbor meeting and gave his contact information out to them. Okay. So presumably, if there's an issue, they could take it up with the property owner and okay. hopefully even talk with the tenants. Okay, great, thanks. I just- A little bit more direct, Sarah. Um, just technically the use review approval would have to be amended. So that's something that the, the property owner would have to bring forward. Okay, I appreciate it. Just knowing that there's a process just in case it turns out that coffee at 7 a.m. is disruptive <laughs> to the surrounding neighborhood. Rowdy coffee. Yeah. Rowdy coffee, <laughs> thanks. Any other questions or comments about the potential call up here? Hey, Lisa, I see you. Questions or comments about the potential call up? Okay, then planning board will not be calling that uh, matter up. So we're gonna jump to the public hearing right now. And the first of the two public hearing items tonight is a public hearing in consideration of the 2150 Folsom subdivision TEC 2020-quadruple-09, a final plat to combine an existing lot, tracts, 
and, a vac and vacated alley right of way into one 27,506 square foot lot and dedicate easements. I'm going to turn it over to Charles Farrow, uh, Development Review Manager, and Charles, take it away. Thanks very much. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. Uh, oh, Shannon sorry, Charles, sorry, I, I should actually, um, uh, before you get started, I should call for any kinds of, any, any disclosures uh, that any planning board member would like to make uh, before the presentation begins. So is there any planning board member who wants to disclose any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest uh, and potentially recuse oneself from this hearing? Go ahead, Charles. Great, so Shannon Moeller uh, will present the staff analysis this evening. Okay, good evening board. Hopefully you can see a PowerPoint. Okay, so um, tonight's first hearing, as you said, was for the 2150 Folsom final plat. Um, so I'll be taking you through a brief overview, including some of the information in staff's memo, the site and case history, the proposed final plat, key issues, and a staff recommendation. Um, so for reference here, you can see the subject property. It's located east of Folsom between Spruce and Pine, the Boulder and White Rock, right? Walk, <laughs> White Rock Ditch passes through the property and an alley formerly existed running east-west through the site, but has recently been vacated by the city. Um, so as you might recall, if you were present about a year ago, um, in June 2019, the planning board approved a site review for the redevelopment of the property as residential dwelling units. And here you can see some of the conditions of approval that required the applicant to complete some additional review processes, including technical document review for final plans, preliminary plat, a final plat, and to vacate the alley right of way internal to the property. And for reference here, just, to, just as a visual, you can see what was approved uh, with the site review. Um, so since that site review approval, several um, of the required conditions of approval have been met. The vacation of the alley was approved by city council in December, 2019. And the technical document review, which included the final plans for transportation, utilities, stormwater, landscaping, final architecture and others was approved um, by staff on June 23rd. The preliminary plat was also approved on June 23rd. And those technical documents and the preliminary plat are staff level approvals, so they're not subject to the call up process. The final plat was also approved by staff on June 25th, and it is subject to a 14 day call up period during which the planning board or any member of the public can call it up. And it was called up on July 7th um, by the representative of, of a group of property owners that's in a legal dispute over title over a portion of the property. So therefore the decision on the item must be made by the planning board at a public hearing. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, so it's important to note the board is only considering the criteria related to the final plat and not to any of the other items listed on this slide. So what exactly is the final plat going to do? Um, the purpose of this final plat is to combine the lots, tracks, and vacated right-of-way into one lot and dedicate any required easements um, as required by the site review condition of approval. So the red lines depict the existing lot or track lines and the boundaries of the former right-of-way. And the result of the plat would be one lot. Um, the plat would also grant some easements here you can see the purple easement is a public access easement to accommodate um, the new construction of a replacement sidewalk. Um, the yellow is a utility easement and the green is an easement over the ditch, which is required per code. And a subdivision agreement has also been executed as is required for plats that are associated with public improvements. So as a point of correction, I want to bring your attention to this slide. 
On page three of the staff memo, I mistyped the exact parcels and ownership information. So as a correction, this slide shows the parcels and ownership as they are referred to in the title report. So you can see the parcels shown in pink consists of lot seven, block 133 East Boulder and is owned fee simple by 2150 Folsom LLC. Parcel two is shown in blue and consists of the two ditch parcels, which is owned fee simple determinable by 2150 Folsom LLC. And parcel three is shown in yellow and consists of lots five and six, block 133 East Boulder and the vacated alley right of way and his own fee symbol by 2150 Folsom LLC and James Tyrell. So the legal dispute regarding ownership is related to parcel two, the ditch parcels shown in blue. So here are the key issues staff identified. The first being if the subdivider provided a current update to the preliminary title report based on an abstract of title required by 9128C2 and the second is if the final plat meets the subdivision standards. So key issue one. This item was called up with a question as to whether this review criterion had been met. The title report was provided by a title company, Fidelity Insurance, and it shows the ownership status of the property as well as encumbrances to the property and relevant elements to the legal history. So it's been the administrative practice of the city to accept this type of report for confirming ownership and identifying encumbrances like loans or easements. So city staff has communicated with the title company and about this title report. And based on that, we've been told that these reports are created based on an abstract of title research and based on the same research that Fidelity uses to, in, to issue title insurance. So the report is produced in this form when the purpose is not to insure the property, but for development review purposes, exactly as we're doing tonight. Many jurisdictions rely on this type of report for development review purposes. Typically, these type of reports have broad disclaimer statements because it is not a policy to insure. Fidelity has confirmed that the records research is the same that goes into the research for issuing title policy. Based on that information, staff determined that attachment C of the title report satisfies this criterion. So moving on to the second key issue. The second key issue was if the final plat meets the final plat subdivision standards. A complete analysis is found in the staff memo attachment B. Generally, you'll find that the criteria include 9128 final plat that includes information to be shown on the final plat and associated documents that the city requires like engineering drawings and the title report. Uh, 9129 requires lot line and boundary verification to ensure that lines close accurately. 91212 includes standards for lots and public improvements, like the minimum lot size, minimum width, solar siting criteria, and all the engineering standards listed here, which are addressed through approval of the engineering drawings, also known as technical documents, that were approved on June 23rd. So as detailed in attachment B, criteria checklist, staff determined that the proposal satisfies the final plat criteria. So required public notice was given in the form of written notification to adjacent property owners. A sign was posted on the property, public notices were published in the daily camera, and therefore all public notice requirements have been met. Staff received a request from the group of property owners and the legal representative that are in the dispute over title to property to keep them appraised of this proposal, which has been done throughout the process. So to conclude, staff finds the proposal to be consistent with the relevant final plat criteria and recommends that the planning board approve the application. And here again are those key issues. Happy to answer any questions at this time. Shannon, um, thank you for that. I, I think that may be the, the last um, staff presentation you ever make in, in Boulder unless you come back and I uh, wanted to thank you for, for that and for all your effort over the years. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Shannon? 
I can't see any hands right now, so you can just speak. I, mean, I think John has his hand up. Okay, yeah. If you want to take down the, um, the screen, we can see everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Shannon, have, has uh, the city attorney's office been involved in this review uh, and the decision? Yes. Making? Okay, good. <laughs> Extensively. I just okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? Ella, are you interested in adding anything or shall we uh, move on? I think you can move on. Okay. Well, then um, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon to queue up the applicant's presentation. Yeah. Um, so the applicant is representative Maureen Eldridge is here. Um, I don't believe she had any slides to share, but is here. I think there was a, a presentation or a couple statements that you wanted to make. Yes. Um, most of which largely will be moot, I hope. <laughs> Um, this, this project has been in some dispute for quite a while um, by the neighbor who does not want the project to proceed and has been um, litigating extensively since 2016 to try to stop it. And um, here is just another flavor of that. Um, the, the code requires a title report and the applicant submitted not only a title report, but a title commitment, a title insurance policy, and an informational commitment. So there have been four different statements made by the title company as to the validity of this title. And as you know, title companies do not like to put their money on the line when they don't think title is valid. Um, so we feel pretty confident in their statements regarding title. Um, some other issues that were raised in Mr. McGuire's letter regarding these parcels is that um, there's an ongoing court case and that should put this on pause. Um, I think the issue, sorry, my computer keeps turning off. You know, we can see you, Maureen. What? We can see you just fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, it, it's simply not true that there's been no judicial determination about the parcel being in fee simple determinable. Um, this case was first tried starting in 2016 and the Boulder County District Court in her order stated that the 1974 deed was a fee simple determinable deed. And then she went on to um, make further orders on the 1914 deed, which is another deed which we're not even talking about. Um, that went up on appeal, and the appellate court said that later deed, 1914, was not um, clear, free, fee, simple title. But it said we, that they agreed that the underlying ownership was fee, simple, determinable. So two courts, the Boulder County District Court and the Appeals Court, have both said that's what this title is. Um, I think that's pretty persuasive. You have received, I think, several trees worth of paper regarding the various filings in the current action that was started by Mr. O'Toole in 2019. Um, one important filing that was not provided to you by Mr. O'Toole's lawyer was the order of the Boulder, Boulder County District Court, which um, I sent along and is included in your packet. And I don't expect you to have read all of that, but I do want to point out that that order dismissed this case on a motion to dismiss and stated that the plaintiffs have filed this action seeking to relitigate issues that have already been resolved and that they had no standing to challenge these deeds. So there is a court case and it will probably be several more court cases. We expect this to be <laughs> litigated into the ground, but um, that doesn't mean that they have good claims and three courts now have said they don't. Um, so now we're here on the plat and the code requirements have all been met and you should proceed to approve it and hopefully not be distracted by the very interesting, if you're a lawyer, court case 
um, but not necessarily relevant here. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. Are there any other applicant proponents who want to speak? There are 15 minutes allotted for you. Okay, well, you will have three minutes at the end of public comment. Oh. That's perfect. We'll take that time at three minutes at the end then, sir. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You, you can also speak now, Mr. Tyrell, if you want. I'll wait till the end. Thank you. Okay, so you'll reserve your three minutes of rebuttal after public comment. Yes, sir. Um, Jean, uh, can you uh, take care of public comment for us, please? Sure, Harmon. Thank you. Again, and, um, unless unless there are any uh, questions directly to the applicant that planning board members have. Go ahead, Jean. Okay, so we'll do the public hearing um, the same way we just we did public comment. If you would like to speak to this to this item, um, you can see the raise hand button at the at the bottom of your screen. If you're on the telephone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. Um, and then I will call on folks and let you unmute um, one by one. Right now I'm seeing one raised hand, um, Joel McGuire. Um, you should be able to talk and Cindy, if you could display the time, you'll have three minutes, Joel. Um, you can go ahead. And Lynn will be next. Okay, I'll try to talk fast. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on this. And for the record, I am the attorney uh, that represents Neil O'Toole, Marianne Carroll, Renala Condominium Association, Tom McWilliams, and M3 Investments, LLC. And I have forwarded a lot of material for you to digest. I don't know whether you've had a chance to even look at it at this point, but basically the material I provided shows that the ownership of parcel two is disputed and that there has in fact been no judicial determination of the ownership and other interests in parcel two. The Court of Appeals did not decide and make a finding that parcel two was owned, parcel two is owned by the ditch company and fee simple determinable. It made a comment in dicta, as we call it in the legal profession, which means it's not critical to the decision, but they said, if we had to choose we would say it was, we would side with the ditch company on this issue. But they said, if we had to decide, they did not decide. And that was not part of the decision. And it also, that statement, even if they had made a decision that was fee simple determinable, that would have conflicted. And we pointed this out in the briefs, that would have conflicted with other statements in the same opinion saying that the ditch company did not hold the property in fee simple. The applicant, uh, Ms. Eldridge, has provided you with a copy of the Boulder District Court ruling that is being appealed. That ruling did not find that the ditch company owned parcel two and fee simple determinable. It simply said, as she accurately said, that my clients could not bring the action and that is being appealed. And even if we lose the appeal, in other words, we lose, the, the Court of Appeals say we don't have a right to contest those issues there still has been no judicial determination of who owns parcel two. Everyone agrees that the applicant must provide proof that it owns parcel two. And that requirement makes complete sense. Um, but the answer is, or, or the question is whether the applicant has satisfied that requirement and the answer is no. Um, they provided this, what they call a title report attachment C that document says that the applicant owns parcel two and fee simple determinable, but it provides no factual basis or legal basis for that conclusion. No analysis. All it says is it relied on certain unnamed sources. In other words, it didn't reach that conclusion. And although Ms. Moeller said uh, she talked to the title company, I'm unaware of that conversation. There's nothing in the record about that conversation. So we don't know how the title company arrived at that conclusion. Uh, and the report itself says that uh, it is not a title report or an abstract of title or a title opinion and should not be relied upon as such. It, said is, it says it is not to be relied upon as a representation of the status of title to parcel two. And it says the company makes no representations as to the report's accuracy. And it said no third party 
is permitted to use or rely upon the information in the report. So there's no way that attachment C proves that the applicant owns parcel two and it is not a title report or an attorney memorandum, both of which must be based upon an abstract of title. And we don't know that that was Bill, the case. If you could so, please wrap up, thank you. Yeah, I've got, just, I'm almost done. So I believe that the requirement has not been satisfied and therefore the final plat cannot be approved unless and until a court resolves the dispute by finally answering the question relating to the ownership of parcel two. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Okay. Um, Lynn, I saw your hand up, but I don't see it now. Um, okay, hand's still up. All right, um, Lynn, you can go ahead and unmute. I didn't take it down. Uh, you know, these are glitches that like, you know, considered in this process. Um, Lynn, you're breaking up a little bit. We can't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to agree with Joel. Um, I don't think it's clear here. I, I haven't heard the term frivolous, like the, this has taken a while since 2016, but um, it needs to be followed through to a final determination. And um, so I wouldn't support the, the um, that that two is actually owned until that's resolved. Um, I really feel it's unethical that my video cannot be up. That is because of some security issues. I do Zooms all the time and no one blocks my Zoom. No one. And certainly not my city that I take off. I deserve some respect. At least be seen. I'm not a black video box. I'm a human being. And I'm going to say this every time I come before council or planning board or any of the boards. That's basic respect denied. And that's not okay. Um, I also want to say that I think that this community would be a lot less divided if there were more of an iterative process with all the boards and the city council a back and forth to work out some of the things that are difficulties between people because as it stands one monologue and then another monologue does not improve public relations. An iterative process does. A lot of times you have to use the, the you know, language is the best we know it, but interpretations are not the same between different parties. And if it can't be resolved iteratively, it's not a positive process and a positive outcome and it doesn't make for a good tenor and a good culture in the community. So that's just my take on iterative communication. And I think it could be done at any board. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. If anyone else would like to address the board on, on this topic, please raise your hand now. Seeing no other hands. Uh, Jim, Jim Toyrell wants to speak. Okay, and then yeah, then as as an app as the applicant. Okay, got it. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim, um, you can go ahead and start. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, the board. Take your time to listen to us today. This project was unanimously approved in June of 2019 by this body. Uh, we had to show ownership of the land at every step of the, along the way, and we have. We have submitted everything the code requires and then some. 
Any challenges to the project by the neighbors should have been brought forward when the project was reviewed by this board in June of 2019. Mr. O'Toole chose not to present any concerns about the project at that time, but instead has just now tried to cast doubt on the title. Mr. O'Toole and Mr. McGuire reference legal language that is found in every title commitment and title report for every project in the city, trying to sow fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the 2150 Folsom title. We don't just have a title report, we have a title commitment, and we have actually an actual title insurance policy issued in August of 2019 that the title company has agreed to and is currently defending 2150 Folsom's title in the ditch property against Mr. O'Toole uh, and Mr. McGuire. As you probably know, the title companies don't insure property if the title is uncertain. For example, the city in its own project at Scott Carpenter Park submitted a title report from Fidelity that has identical language as the one here and referenced by Mr. McGuire. Is the city's title now subject to further review by Mr. O'Toole's standard? It should be. Mr. O'Toole is trying again to tie this project up in the courts by dragging me through more litigation. The courts have already spoken about this matter several times. The bottom line is that the Boulder District Court most recently dis dismissed the case because Mr. O'Toole doesn't have any rights or standing to challenge the deed. In the prior case, both the District Court and the appell Appeals Court agreed that the ditch company had fee simple determinal ownership. Does the planning board really want to get involved in interpreting and investigating every deed and every project? Nothing has changed from June of 2019 to today, other than a neighbor continuing to harass his future neighbor and this board with paperwork and process, thus wasting everyone's time. Why are O'Toole and McGuire wasting the time of this body today with issues and challenges that should have been brought up a year ago with the site review hearing? The project site is currently a couple of ramshackle buildings and weed trees. My project would turn it into a beautiful set of homes and approve the block and neighborhood. I guess some people just don't like any development or changes, I guess. Why would O'Toole and Mr. McGuire harass a future neighbor so vigorously? No, really, why are they? I don't get it, I don't understand. All I want is for my wife and I to move into our forever home. To stop this development today would set a new precedent and open up this body to reviewing title for every single project down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, we're going to take it back to the board and um, open it up for we're closing the public hearing and we're going to open it up for deliberation. Um, the first key issue to go over is uh, has the subdivider provided a current update to the preliminary title report? or attorney memorandum based upon an abstract of title consistent with subsection 912.8.C2 in the Boulder Revised Code. Anyone can jump in to talk about this key issue. David? I'll just say yes. Okay. Is there anybody who wants to make any additional comments? I'll uh, take a negative poll and see if there's anybody who says no. Okay. So there's no one on planning board who thinks that the subdivider has not provided a current update to the preliminary title report. Um, and, uh, and I think I, I just want to say a little bit more for the record, um, which is that, you know, in this case, um, planning board is uh, looking at whether the applicant has met the submittal requirements for tech doc and for uh, subdivision and not putting ourselves in the shoes of a court to do legal analysis and try to figure out ownership. And if, um, if the uh, neighbors, as they're referred to in the lawsuits, um, are successful ever, in establishing that they have any claim to title, then the applicant's insurance policy will be uh, obligated to do something to, uh, to make the, the neighbors whole. But um, at this point, um, planning board's role is really just to determine whether or not the submittal requirement under um, 9128 uh, 8 has been met. And I'm gonna agree with my brothers and sisters on planning board that it has been. 
Um, so let's move on to the second key issue, which is does the final plat application meet the final plat subdivision standards? Um, are there any planning board members who want to comment on that? Are there any planning board members who do not believe that the final plat application meets the final plat subdivision standards? Okay. So the planning board has reviewed the, um, the materials that were submitted and the staff report and agrees with staff's finding that the final plat application has met the application standards for subdivision um, and, uh, and therefore um, we agree that that key issue has been satisfied. So are there any comments that any planning board member wishes to make, additional questions that any planning board member wishes to ask, um, or should we entertain a motion? You're a loud group tonight. Um, I suppose I will uh, entertain a motion. Is there anyone who would like to move to approve the tech doc review in front of us? I'd be glad to make a motion. Okay, David, go for it. Uh, I move to approve technical document review case number TEC 2020-00009, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached review criteria checklist found in attachment B as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval, condition of approval. And David, if I may interrupt, could you include the correction that Shannon made as part of her presentation today? Sure. Can you put that up, please? I, I don't know if Dave has that in front of him. Great. And while you're bringing it up, I'll just uh, comment that I did read through all that material that was sent to us, just so in case there's any question as to whether we actually look at that stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I did not notice that the wording had been on the recommended motion had been revised. It, it had not actually, but um, I, Shannon presented that the criteria analysis, or maybe the memo, um, described the ownership. Oh, yes. And so um, just adding on to this um, and with um, taking into account the correction as described during the presentation tonight. With regard to parcel ownership? With regard to parcel ownership. Thank you. Great. Um, I think we're accepting seconds. Okay, I'll second it. I'll second it. Oh, okay, John, I think I beat you to it. Um, cool. I'll give myself the, the second then, but thank you. Um, so we've got a motion on the table by Ensign. It's been seconded by Zuckerman. And uh, are, are there any folks who wish to discuss the motion, make a friendly? Okay. All right, then I'm going to restate the motion. Sarah, was that a hair or? That was a hair thing. <laughs> that was a hair thing. Okay, good. Um, then let's uh, let, let me restate the motion, make it the motion of the board. Um, so uh, planning board moves to approve technical document review, case number TEC 2020 quadruple 09, incorporating the staff memorandum, including the change to uh, the ownership diagram in the revised memorandum and the attached review criteria checklist found in attached B as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Uh, call a roll call vote. Ensign? Aye. Verstel? Yes. Vitelli? Aye. Silver? Aye. Smith? Aye. Montoya? Aye. And Zuckerman says aye. So uh, congratulations. Uh, we've approved Tech Talk Review 2020 quadruple 09. And we're going to move on to the next. Actually, Herman, before we move on, um, you kind of alluded to the fact that this is concludes Shannon's uh, service to the board and the city this evening. So yeah. um, I just want to take it a moment to thank her for her six years of service. She's going to be moving on to a senior planner position uh, at the town of Erie. So um, we have really enjoyed having her and uh, we wish her the best of luck. Shannon, do you want to say anything? Thanks. It's been it's been a wild ride, so it's been really fun. I'll miss you guys. I'll miss you too. Thank you. Thanks for doing that, Charles. So we're going to move on to the second public hearing item on our agenda of public hearing items, second and last. 
Um, this is a agenda title, public hearing and consideration of a site review application, case number LUR 2019-00058, for the redevelopment of the properties at 1750 15th Street and 1680 Canyon Boulevard, with a 148,820 square foot three-story mixed use building containing 14,048 square feet of commercial space on the first floor and 147 residential units on the garden first, second, and third levels. Development includes one level of underground parking with 102 vehicular and 27 moped motorcycle parking spaces. So before I turn it over to Charles, I'm gonna ask for any ex parte uh, or other disclosures um, uh, or, or any conflicts that might potentially require recusal from planning board members. Nobody? Okay, then I'm going to disclose the same uh, disclosure that I've been disclosing over and over again um, for the last four planning board meetings, which is that the engineer on this project is JVA. Um, JVA is the engineer on a project that I have been working on for two years in Gilpin County. Um, I have no, relax, no contractual relationship with JVA. Rather, I'm the attorney who's handling the entitlement for the client and JVA is the engineer who's handling the design of utilities for the client. Um, so uh, I've looked through the criteria for conflict in uh, chapter two or title two of the Boulder Revised Code and uh, this uh, disclosure is, I believe, necessary, but I also um, don't see that it violates any um, requirement of code. And, um, and so I'm gonna just make the disclosure and participate in the hearing. Hella? I know you have a question you like to ask. Are you going to be able to be fair and impartial and to make a decision solely based on the evidence presented to you today? Absolutely, I will be able to be fair and impartial. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, with that, let me turn it over to um, Charles again. Uh, and Charles, it's all yours. Great, thanks very much. Sloan Walbert, uh, senior planner, is gonna present this item tonight to the board. Sorry about that, I'm getting used to the new um, format. Uh, so good evening, everyone. As uh, Harmon described, the site review for your consideration tonight is for the redevelopment of the properties at 1750 15th Street and 1680 Canyon Boulevard with a nearly 149,000 square foot mixed use building containing approximately 14,000 square feet of commercial space and 147 residential units on four levels. Just as a quick overview, I will cover the required review process, the surrounding context. I'll do a description of the proposed project, bring up some key issues for discussion and end with a staff recommendation to the board. In terms of the review process, the project is required to complete a site review because the development meets the thresholds for the DT5 zone district. A concept plan was reviewed by planning board and city council last year. Um, because the applicant has requested vested rights, the project requires a public hearing before planning board. Through the site review, the proposal includes requests for three stories for the building where two are permitted um, to allow a reduction in the required amount of transparent materials facing a public street that's specifically on the 16th street elevation. There's also setback modifications to the front yard, rear yard, and the third story setback to allow for a building that is built up to the street. And lastly, they are requesting a 31% parking reduction. Uh, the site is within the interface area of downtown Boulder and is subject to the downtown urban design guidelines. 
It is located within the interface area, which is located on the borders of downtown and is comprised of the blocks that link the downtown core to the surrounding residential neighborhoods. And this area requires special design sensitivities for buildings that are located adjacent to residential uses like this one. The project requires review by the Design Advisory Board. The board did review this proposal um, at a meeting on January 8th of this year, and a summary of the DAB comments were provided as an attachment to the memo. In terms of public notification, written notice was sent to property owners within 600 feet and a sign was posted on the property. The applicant also held a neighborhood meeting um, in June of last year to introduce the concept to the neighborhood and solicit feedback. There was some public comment um, received by staff which has been forwarded to the board for consideration. <clears throat> The site is approximately two acres in area. It's located south of and adjacent to Canyon Boulevard between 15th and 16th Street streets. The Pearl Street Mall is located two blocks to the northwest, and the site is located within the Central Area General Improvement District. The site is designated as regional business on the land use map, which is the most intense of the business land uses. Housing is listed as a desired use compatible with the surrounding character. Um, there is no maximum residential des density designated under this land use. Um, there's also a sliver of land along the ditch that is designated as open space other. The corresponding zoning is downtown five, which is defined in the land use code as a business area within the downtown core that's in the process of changing to a higher intensity use. Um, it's also recognizes the area for the greatest potential for new development and redevelopment. The site is impacted by the 100 year floodplain in the high hazard zone of Boulder Creek. The proposed structure would be located outside of these floodplains, but within the 500 year floodplain. In terms of the existing conditions, the site does contain two buildings which were constructed in the 1950s and 60s. The site is dominated by surface parking. There's limited interior landscaping. The building that formerly housed Liquor Mart has historic significance for um, its function as an early supermarket building within the city. However, historic preservation staff have found that modifications to the building over time has compromised um, its historic significance. And the North Boulder Farmer's Ditch runs along the south edge of the property um, with some mature trees located on the banks of the ditch, which you can see in this image here. <clears throat> um, as I described, the site is located within a downtown area that is expected to change given the underlying zoning, um, which allows for large, large scale development potential and the occurring redevelopment along Canyon. To the west are Central Park, the Civic Area, um, Boulder Creek, and the city's municipal buildings. The CU campus is located approximately half a mile to the south. The site is located on the outer edge of the downtown zoning and is surrounded by smaller commercial establishments. On the north side of Canyon, buildings have been built to greater scales. Um, the north side of Canyon is within the same zoning district and contains some of the most urban buildings in Boulder, um, many of which were constructed within the last 20 years and are four stories and nearly 55 feet in height. Directly north of the site is the First Presbyterian Church, which is roughly 50 feet in height. A new three-story commercial building was recently constructed to the east at 1650 Canyon. That was formerly the site of Wells Fargo. Um, development along 15th Street consists of one, two, and three-story commercial structures within the 15th Street Design District. The Goss Grove residential neighborhood is located to the southeast, which is characterized by single family homes on small lots. Um, there's also some small scale multifamily development. Moving on to the proposal, it is a mixed use development with ground floor commercial uses of approximately 14,000 square feet. The commercial spaces are designed to be flexible to meet future needs. The, 
current proposal would be for uses like restaurants, offices, or retail sales. The residential portion is proposed to be a mix of efficiency living units, which the city defines as units less than 475 square feet in area. There's also one bedroom, two bedroom, three building, three bedroom, <laughs> and four bedroom units. The units range in size from approximately 300 square feet up to 1600 square feet. Um, the board should note that a use review was withdrawn since the amount of efficiency living units is less than 40% of the development, which is current, allowed under the current land use code. In terms of parking, um, there is no parking required for the non-residential uses because it is located within CAGED. One vehicular parking space is required for each residential unit, which is a total of 147 required spaces. The parking garage contains 102 vehicular spaces. There's also 27 moped motorcycle parking spaces. And as I described, a 31% parking reduction has been requested. In terms of bike parking, um, the proposal includes 238 long-term spaces, which would be located within the secured parking garage. Um, there's also 92 short-term spaces proposed along Canyon and 15th. The intensity of development in the DT5 district is controlled by a minimum open space and a maximum floor area ratio. The allowable FAR in DT5 is one of the highest in the downtown zone districts and the proposal is for a 1.82 FAR. <clears throat> The site design is for a piano shaped building primarily oriented toward Canyon and 15th, but addressing all frontages and the creek. Two interior courtyards are punched into the building. The portion of the building fronting on 15th Street has been pushed back from the street to accommodate an amenity and seating area, bike parking, and also some rain gardens. Uh, the parking garage is located below grade on a garden level, which is accessed by a ramp on 15th Street. Loading and service access for the commercial uses are located on 16th Street, which is the location of the um, current loading area for Liquor Mart. A multi-use path is proposed along to run along the north side of the ditch. <clears throat> the development does have direct commercial entries onto Canyon Boulevard. Um, there's also a primary residential entry provided on 15th Street, which would be access to the lobby, leasing office, fitness center, and other amenities. Two of the residential units would also have direct entries on 16th Street. In terms of open space, the proposal includes those interior courtyards I described, a common rooftop terrace, private roof terraces, balconies facing both the streets and the interior courtyards, an outdoor seating area on 15th Street, some at-grade terraces, and also that indoor amenity space. Um, here you're seeing the outdoor amenity space on 15th Street. Here is a view of those interior courtyards. Um, I just wanted to point out too that the main residential entry on 15th Street is both is proposed to be transparent to provide a visual connection through the building to those interior courtyards, which will help to provide some relief to the density. Uh, moving on to building design, the building is three stories and 38 feet in height. Um, the design is contemporary with a more modern aesthetic. It's been broken into separate forms and a series of interlocking forms to break up the mass and scale, which you can see here. Proposed building materials include storefront windows, fiber cement siding, some sandstone look panels, metal panel, metal panel cladding, and some metal accents. There is generous um, glazing and storefront windows and also those masonry elements on Canyon to define the commercial portion of the building. And the frontage on Canyon is also designed to accommodate any future outdoor seating, which is shown in these perspectives. So um, moving on to the key issues, the first being whether the proposal meets the site review criteria. Staff finds that the proposal does meet the site review criteria. Um, the project meets the intent of the regional business land use designation with a mix of uses 
and a design that activates the streets. Locating new residential units on a multimodal corridor um, in close proximity to a major employment center is consistent with policies that encourage workforce housing within the city. The proposal includes a variety of unit types and sizes. It is compatible, contextual, and in character with the area. Um, while the existing character is eclectic, there are buildings in the area that have comparable characteristics and um, comparable heights. Uh, there are several buildings within a two block radius that are three stories. And lastly, the open space is appropriate con um, considering the urban context and proximity to that civic area in the um, Boulder Creek. <clears throat> in terms of compatibility with the downtown urban design guidelines, staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the guidelines for the interface areas by promoting a human scale development that reinforces the character of downtown as a pedestrian place. The building design is reflective of contemporary times, yet appropriate with traditional references. The design is respectful of the established residential area to the south with service areas located away from residential uses. The proposal represents four-sided design. There are design elements like storefront windows and emphasized building entries, which help activate the pedestrian experience. Parking is provided below grade and the entrance to the garage has been integrated into the building design. And lastly, DAB agreed with the proposed rhythm and pattern of the building as appropriate considering the building scale and also the site location. The last key issue is um, regarding the 31% parking reduction. Staff finds that the proposal does meet the criteria for a parking reduction based on transportation demand management strategies, the site context and enhanced transit and multimodal access. Staff finds that the parking needs of the occupants of and visitors would be adequately accommodated. The site is located in close proximity to several major employers and services and is also well connected to transit and that larger multimodal network. The downtown Boulder station is located less than a block away to the west on Canyon. The proposed TDM plan um, does ensure that alternative modes of transportation will continue to reduce the need for on-site parking on an ongoing basis. That um, TDM plan does include the provision of eco passes for residents and um, the commercial uses would also be eligible for those. They also propose an alternative transportation fund for the residential units to help cover the costs of alternative modes like rideshare or an ego car share membership. And lastly, parking spaces would be unbundled for residential units and rented separately from the rent, which helps to discourage residents from owning and storing vehicles on site. And that, on that note, um, staff does recommend approval of the site review application and recommends adoption of the motion shown on the screen. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions. I see John has his hand up. Thank you, Sloan. John Gerstel, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sloan, can you uh, describe the nature of the path that will go along the ditch, uh, whether that's uh, part of an existing uh, a continuation of an existing uh, multi-use or bike path, or, and will it be publicly accessible at all times? Sure, so it is not an extension of an existing path, but it is on the transportation master plan. So they're constructing the public portion on their site, which in the future will hopefully um, extend. And it, it, yes, it would be public, open to the public and meet all the city standards for a multi-use path. Thank you. Sarah, I've been trying to stay Sarah. Go ahead. I saw you nod, yeah. nod at me. So um, I wanna ask you the same question that I had sent to you via email about the design guidelines having a 75 foot maximum front uh, facade. Um, if you could sort of talk through 
uh, the design DAB's response to that, that would be helpful. I'm actually going to ask, we have Kalani Pahoa, who's the city's um, urban designer on the meeting, and I, she should be able to answer that. Thanks, Kalani. So DAB did address the 75 foot um, recommendation from the guidelines. They found that the building with the facade length as is was appropriate, but with the rhythm and pattern and the way that the applicant had designed the building, it did have human scale elements. Okay. Um, just as a flag, I'm, I am going to ultimately ask the applicant to describe in, in some detail that rhythm and um, the how, how they have dealt with that. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Planning board members. Okay. David. Um, yeah, um, I'll go ahead and ask this because um, I, I was curious about city council calling this up uh, a concept. Uh, and when I looked at what their concerns were, they spent a lot of time on the fact that the edges of this are, it's all in the 500 year floodplain, but the edges border on 100 year floodplain. And uh, uh, the city council specifically asked that that be addressed for site review. And maybe that will come up more in the applicant, but from the city standpoint, do we feel that that, um, I, I did look through the supporting materials that, that, that that's been addressed well in this, uh, in the site review. Sure, we actually have Kristen Shepard, who's the city's floodplain manager on the line and she should be able to answer that question. Great. Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> no problem. And I'm sorry, David, I missed the, the first couple sentences of your of your question. Could you, I heard the last part, but the first part cut out for me. I think in setting it up, I was just um, very curious about um, the concerns that city council had in calling this up at concept review state, stage. And I heard when I looked at what they were asking, they were asking a lot about that fact that um, the edges of the building border on the 100 year floodplain. And they were concerned about uh, whether uh, scenarios uh, are addressed uh, in the final design. So I just thought I would get the city perspective on that. Sure, so um, we went round and round about the edges of the building in the 100 year floodplain and uh, we are required to only look at um, the 100 year uh, regulations. And so uh, the applicant has met all those requirements and has kept the edges of the building including foundation and roof overhangs is out of the 100 year. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? John? Yeah. Uh, will the uh, ground floor apartments along the, the multi-use path have uh, direct access outside uh, to, the, to the path? Or must they use the, the main entrance on 15th Street to, to get to their building? Uh, from the path. Sure, so that was one of the comments made at concept plan was um, exploring the possibility of having entries directly onto the path. Um, after examining it in more detail, um, the applicant had some concern, safety concerns by doing that. So they will not have direct access onto the path. Um, so they will either use the entries on 15th or 16th, and there is a direct entry to the um, bike parking along the multi-use path. But the applicant can probably speak to that in more detail. Okay, I hope the applicant does. Thank you. Other planning board questions for staff? Okay. All right, well, turn it back over to you, Sloan for the applicant presentation. Sure, just be patient, it'll take me a couple. And while Sloan gets that going, uh, just a time check, the uh, applicant has 15 minutes under our Zoom rules. Uh, so I don't wanna leave that on, so I'm just gonna uh, keep the time myself on my watch and I hope the applicant does too and then uh, you have three minutes for rebuttal per the rules uh, that you can you don't have to reserve but go ahead and ask for it if you feel like you have any need to rebut anything uh, after public comment. So 
sorry, it's working on it. I couldn't have both open at the same time. <laughs> so it's opening. Problem. Probably a graphics heavy PowerPoint. Yeah, it's, it's coming. Adrian, feel free to start if you want and I'll bring it up when it's ready. It's up to you. Rob, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, I, can, I can go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, thank you everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you planning board. Pleasure to be back with you again and Sloan, thank you so much for the thorough overview. Uh, my name is Rob Bach, Development Director for Core Spaces. Uh, and as a refresher on core, we are a fully integrated developer, owner, and operator founded in 2010 and based out of Chicago and Austin. Over the past 10 years, we have developed in over 20 cities across the nation. While we do have a diverse footprint, our number one priority when coming into a new city is to truly understand all the dynamics that make each place so special and unique, and then custom tailor our design approach and residential offering to complement and enhance our new communities. We've had a great iterative journey here in Boulder over the past two years, and we look forward to presenting our design progression, which we believe has been greatly enhanced by the collaboration with our local neighborhood, city staff, and Greater Boulder. One of the concerns we heard early on is, who is this project intended for? So CORE's main focus is developing in educational markets, but in certain cities and specific locations where there exists even greater demand drivers beyond the university, we shift our approach and strategy to serve the greater renter community beyond the student population which is exactly what we have proposed here at 15th and Canyon. We believe this is the perfect location for a wide variety of lifestyles to benefit from the walkability of downtown and the numerous multimodal transit options with connectivity throughout Boulder. To touch on how we'll operate this property, our management arm of course space is currently managing over 4,000 units across 20 properties. All of will benefit from this deep expertise and focus on our future tenant experience. This will be actively managed by full-time site staff that will keep this building operating an optimal performance and it continues to be sure we are continuing our growing our roots within our new neighborhood and greater Boulder. With that, I'll hand it over to Adrian Silver with Silver Spar and Architects to dig into the details of, of our whole proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I, can everyone hear me okay, I presume? Well, we've had quite a journey in the last year and a half since we met with planning board last. Uh, I know a number of board members are not present for that hearing. And so we want to give you a brief overview of how we've developed the project since that time. Uh, as you may have noticed in the packet, the project though, the configuration of the plan has not changed that much. The overall feeling of the building has changed tremendously. Next slide, please, Sloan. Um, there are significant changes in the way the building is organized on the site, but the largest difference you'll see is the way it feels as a presence on the street. And uh, that was directly out of a request from the council. The planning board was supportive of what we had shown in general with certain caveats about the nature of the pedestrian and, and um, urban design uh, expression of the project. Next slide, please. So we're going to just give you a brief visual tour running clockwise, counterclockwise from the northwest corner of 15th uh, and Canyon Street. And on the right are a list of um, all of the things that we have been asked to address by you, by council, by staff, by DAB. And uh, next slide. A lot of it has to do with uh, the way the building meets the street, the way we create public spaces making a, uh, a, a attempt to understand what we can do in relation to increasing street crossings at Canyon, um, uh, creating a four-sided building. Next slide. How we created amenity spaces that, that are um, respectful of our neighbors. Um, and next slide, please. The providing uh, improvements to the pedestrian and bicycle environment um, on multiple sides of this building. I, I don't know if I said creating a four-sided building, but as you can see, as we turn around, next slide, please. Addressing that on all sides, uh, how flood concerns as were raised by board members and council. Providing a mix of housing types that, that addresses the larger need for housing in the downtown area. 
Next slide, please. And providing open space that increases uh, the, uh, that, that addresses the, the concerns for a, a, uh, a pedestrian friendly environment along the streets making most of landscape in the setback areas and uh, increase significantly actually the amount of landscape on the site. Next. Uh, providing enough parking and providing a, a alternative to parking that, that really supports the lifestyle of people who want to live in, a, in the downtown urban environment of Boulder. Next. And along with that, the various civic improvements that were requested for um, uh, ditch improvements, for uh, uh, bike paths, bus stops, uh, and so on. Next, please. And uh, then to just step into the building as it is now, as it addresses all of those concerns. Uh, next slide, please. One of the, the, the early concerns expressed by the board, and I'm contrasting what you saw at the Count the uh, planning board hearing on the 2nd of February to where we are today. The, one of the key areas that you asked us to look at was how we can improve the pedestrian environment along 15th Street and make a, 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 a safe but also pedestrian friendly area uh, that, that addresses the, the access from the high school to downtown. Next slide, please. Uh, there was also concern expressed about the, the, the original location of the vehicle entry and a more pedestrian friendly environment along 15th Street that, that really took into consideration the activity that not only exists today, but we would try to create in the future. Uh, and that would be in part to re look at relocating where services uh, come into the building. Next, please. At the hearing, we also prevented some additional looks at what we might be able to do to improve what we showed in the packet that was submitted at the concept plan hearing. We, we showed the possibility of moving the trash up and the loading area away from the 15th Street side and into the northern corner along 16th. Right now, as you know, Liquor Mart, that whole portion along the west side on 16th Street is all service zone with a roll curb. We're able to limit all of our trash and loading to a very small area and focus more on, on a, a more pedestrian zone along the west side. But there was still concern, next please, that, uh, that having the, the uh, access into the underground parking uh, might conflict with other driveway cuts on the west side of the street and was possibly too close to um, to, to those to this to the corner so we, we in the in the in the project as it was submitted for site review we have relocated the drive and we have refocused the northwest corner of the building both on the canyon and the 15th street side towards pedestrian retail activity next please and these are just a few shots of how we're trying to do that by way of creating a a uh, a retail space, a restaurant, coffee shop on the corner, and then as that points southward towards the, the, the uh, high school, and then the building entry, which is adjacent to it. Next. In the concept review, there was concern about the, the proximity of all the amenity spaces of the outdoor patio and likewise the sun deck on the rooftop uh, as being too close to the neighbors on the south side. The neighbors had expressed both in terms of the concept review hearing and in our public meeting that they really did not feel comfortable about all of that being so close to that port portion of the site. Next slide, please. So in the submittal as it is now, we created the entire southern zone as uh, residential units that face along the bike path. And we moved back the third floor significantly so that the, what the, the, the face that we're showing to the southern side is that of a two-story building. Um, and access, as I think was noted, to the bicycle parking on the lower level. Next, please. So these are a few shots that show that bicycle park, that uh, the, the uh, new bike path created that links up 
uh, to the Boulder Creek path uh, at the tea house. Next slide, please. And here you can see, this is the view looking towards the uh, north west from uh, 16th Street and the bike path. And you can see how the building steps up from two stories along the bike path to the Canyon Street side on the right. And across the street, I believe it was the first Presbyterian Church was about 50 feet high. The highest point on this building is 30, 38 feet uh, from its lowest datum on the, on the southern corner of the building. Next, please. Along with that, we moved the sun deck and the outdoor seating to the northwest corner of the site away from the neighbors and closer to the activity along Canyon and out of respect for what was requested of us uh, both at concept review and with the neighbors. Next slide, please. One of the things that I believe planning board asked us to look at and uh, we prepared for uh, discussion with council was whether or not a mid-block mid crossing of Canyon could be supported. Uh, we showed these diagrams to city council at the council call up. Next, please. This is a, a, a map of the city going from about 17th to 9th uh, along Canyon. And you can see in blue the, the, the continuous connections that run north-south and where they are discontinuous in yellow where there are so-called mid-block pedestrian crossings. But if you look closely, they are not mid-block crossings at all. They are the continuity of the 300-foot uh, rhythm of the, of, the, of the streets that had been taken out, both to make the, uh, the, the downtown um, pedestrian path between uh, the med and, um, and, uh, and the hotel and connect through to the south through uh, Central Park. So in fact, the next slide please, if we were to put in mid-block crossings, they would be cutting into halfway through each of those blocks if the rhythm of mid-block crossings were in fact created on the Liquor Mart Olive site, it would be half as much as what you find today along Canyon, which would have significant impacts to traffic movement on the street along Canyon, which I don't think was intended. And council, next please, was not particularly interested in that. They were really just looking for permeability into the site. And even if that was just visibility into the courtyards. So what we did in that regard was rather than break up the, the, um, the, the commercial strip that we're creating along Canyon, we created access into the, um, the courtyard from the 15th Street entry. And you can see here that we opened up the connection from the lobby into the two courtyards that we're providing in the center of the building. Next, please. Uh, planning board and council also wanted to make sure that uh, we were creating courtyards that were usable, that were of appropriate scale, and we believe that we've been able to do that. Uh, each of them have a different character. One is a little more active and the other one a little more passive in terms of the the uh, activity that we're anticipating in them. Next. One other thing that came up, and I, I believe it was uh, at council, but it may have been the board's concern, was that we also make sure we, could, we address the requirements for complete streets along Canyon. The complete streets has not been adopted, and uh, we are required to actually meet the standards of the design and construction standards for Canyon improvements. We, however, did provide enough space that in the future, whichever the city chooses to adopt in terms of the three options for complete streets or any other options within the amount of space that the three options identify can be provided in the area that we've left between the building and the, and the existing um, Canyon right of way. In fact, the, the right of way has been expanded to allow for, for changes in the future. Next slide. But the biggest uh, concern that, that, that council raised was that the feeling of the building, the overall expression of the building was too bold and out of context with the neighborhood and the neighborhood being here, both uh, the, the neighborhood of Canyon Boulevard in downtown and the, the adjacent uh, stepping down to Gosgrove neighborhood. 
Next slide, please. You can see how we've, we've tried to address that. It's a similar, a similar uh, basic configuration, but we changed the feeling of, of the building to a, a more sedate rhythm of, of, of spaces along Canyon. Next. And just taking you through these a little bit more. Um, so we've simplified the forms. Next slide, please. And, uh, and provided what we think is a, a, a nice continuity and rhythm along the street. Next. And as you move around the building, you can get a feel for it. But um, we hopefully have addressed the concerns raised in terms of the character of the overall uh, structure. Next. One question also that came up from council was whether or not we could do affordable housing on site. And just briefly touching on it, we did a study, we reviewed it with the affordable housing, uh, with, a, with the housing division to look at, as requested, the possibility of the, ROG, the ROBS rag stop parcel next being used for affordable housing. Uh, we did a study of how you could use it, that, uh, that you could conceivably get up to 10 units of affordable housing that meet the standards per the requirement for this property, meaning for the, the scale of units provided at Olive, and we found that <clears throat> we couldn't do more than 10 units per floor, next please, which allowed for the, a maximum of 30 units, but that would also mean that affordable housing would be on the ground floor on Canyon, which is questionable, and that there were no real spaces for any shared uh, amenities. But the big kicker was that underground parking cannot be connected to any other property across parking uh, across property lines. So in order to get any underground parking and you really have to do the ground floor, the majority of the ground floor would have to be a uh, access to underground parking, which if you recall the Rob's uh, original proposal from about 10 years ago, took up most of that first floor. So we ruled that out with the, we believe the agreement of the uh, housing division. Next please. I know there are concerns about uh, the impacts of floodplain on this site. I'm going to briefly touch on it to say that we have addressed it. We believe to the degree that we, we, uh, that we, we meet the standards of the city. Happy to get into details with it, but I think I'll leave that to uh, your question period since I think I'm running out of time here. Next. And that also affects the lower level or the lower portion of the first floor on the south side. And again, happy to address that in your questions. I believe that goes through the main body of what we had to show. We have a lot of other slides we can share with you should you, should you wish um, to address any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, great job bringing it in on time. I yeah, appreciate that. To, uh, do any planning board members have any questions for the applicant? I, I know we had a couple. All right, Sarah. Um, thanks so much, uh, Adrian, for that. Um, I, I did have some questions. I'll just put two of them out there. One is I'd really like it if you could walk us through the, the um, facades again. And then my second question is also facade related, which is the stone-like <laughs> uh, cladding. Um, what exactly is that? I'm going to have my associate Tayamaki uh, address these questions. So, hi. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tayamaki from Antonovich and Associates. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak on this um, exciting project and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So, the stone that we're proposing on this facade is, is we're still in discussions with the contractor, but it will be a um, a sandstone panel. Uh, we, we're planning to use a local local sandstone that actually Adrian's uh, son showed to us. Um, we thought we it gave it a, a more natural and softer feel while maintaining the kind of clean aesthetic. Uh, the, the, the question we have is, is it going to be a composite where it's the sandstone on a um, honeycomb backing or whether it's going to be a sandstone slab adhered to the um, facade itself. But 
it, yeah. it will be a, um, a real sandstone finish. I'll just add that we, we're, one of our concerns is making sure that the panels are safe. Uh, we're looking to use the local sandstone. My son is a stonemason, that's why he's like it, but anyway. Um, so it's a little bit still to be developed in terms of the jointing pattern so that we can safely put it up. Yep. Okay, thank you. And then the, the, um, the facade um, massing, the, can you talk a bit about how you've tried to break up this extremely long set of uh, frontages? Sure. And, and so we, you know, we have, we've had a lot of discussions about that and it's the way we've approached this is it, kind of a, a result of the plan and also the location. So, you know, we looked at the code where it asked for a, a 75 foot max length and you subdivide in that, that scale and rhythm. And, and when we looked around the area, and typically you see that more on the northern side of Canyon where you have the larger, taller, more commercial developments. They'll have a long facade and then they break those up typically in that 75 foot rhythm. But because we're, we're a, a more residential focused develop, development and, and because we're on the southern side of Canyon where you know we're a transitional project into more residential locations, we felt that we should be breaking the uh, facade of the building up into smaller, smaller components. And so what, what, we, what we did was we looked at the requirement that we have to provide um, balconies for each unit. And then we used that requirement as a way to provide a negative space between a series of components. And then you can kind of, you can see quite well. And if I think we move to the next slide, I think it's slide 32. Yeah, this shows it a little better. So at each end of the building, we have these larger corner expressions that give us a more elegant and dramatic expression at the corners, which is the same place we use a, use as a stone. And then we use where we require the balconies to then make a, a physical break from those entities. And then we have a series of more residential scale um, blocks or components that then, you know, in a very consistent and organized rhythm move down the facade. So we're, we're looking at what we think is a more human scale approach to the 75 foot max length change. And so you have, you almost have a, a feeling of a series of a smaller single residence townhomes moving along that face. And if we can move to slide 10 to show the um, commercial street, we, we kind of, we've used that same kind of rhythm again to, um, it's a slightly different counter rhythm because the, the commercial elements are of a, of a slightly wider, wider tempo, but you, we essentially have the recess that you enter into the uh, commercial space with, and that acts in the same, same way that the, that the balcony does. It makes a subdivision at, at a regular pace down Canyon street, it's at, and it's at a slightly different width and rhythm. So you get these two counter rhythms of the commercial space down below and then the residential spaces above. So as you can see it here, you have the, the retail rhythm down below, which is a slightly off, it's, you would call it a counter rhythm in, in the music. And then each one of those uh, uh, commercial entries have have it emphasized with the balcony, sorry, the canopy coming out with the retail signage. And so with those two um, rhythms of the re residential and then the retail interplaying with each other. And I feel this mm -hmm. image shows it well that, you know, the, the man standing in front of the uh, entry, you know, it feels more like a human scale approach to the 75 foot max length code requirement as opposed to the more commercial uh, and approach on the could, northern side of the street. Could I just say, not quite as eloquently as Ty, that 
what we were trying to do was actually break up also the rhythm along the sky that we were creating not just one continuous elevation of height at the top but a, a rhythm that that had some interplay along the edge of the sky and that that rhythm on the street level is actually a different rhythm and it's not necessarily obvious but the, because of the scale requirements of the units versus the scale requirements of the commercial entries, they just were different. So we let them play off one another and they don't in any way seem to be in conflict in the way that it's come together. So we feel pretty good about that. Okay, so uh, I think John was next. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, you heard me ask uh, earlier about the the access to the ground floor apartments from from the bike path, and uh, so I was interested in your thoughts on that. Rob, do you want to start? Yeah, Rob. yeah. So John, John, I'll take that one. Um, it, we, we studied that pretty pretty extensively and looked at it both ways, and and ultimately had a pretty long conversation with with Dab on that topic as well. Um, so so there's a couple of big concerns that we had. One is just safety and security um, and kind of two elements of that. One is kind of controlling entry points into our building. Um, so we do have the two duplex units on the east side that do have exterior uh, stairways up, but we felt adding, I, I guess, I don't know how many we have, uh, eight more along the south side would be a you know, safety concern for the overall building. But also if you have that stairwell and you're walking down the stairwell onto a, you know, what we hope to be a very activated multi-use path with, with bikers, et cetera, um, there's all kinds of collision points that, that we were trying to avoid. Um, so we, we felt that w those, those units with their exterior balconies would still really activate, um, you know, that back space, eyes on the, on the street, you know, so to speak, for uh, that, that dip back ditch area. So we feel it's still going to be a great improvement on what's there today, uh, especially when we, you know, really clean up the landscaping back there and, um, you know, you know, bring all the improvements that we're proposing here. So um, we, th we think it's a you know, pretty elegant solution solving all of those issues. Thank you. Any other planning board members with questions for the applicant? Peter. Peter. Thanks a lot. Well done picking up some of the comments. Uh, if I'm a pedestrian and I approach this building, I'm standing on the corner and I'm looking at it. So I'm facing southeast, I suppose. If I'm to go south towards campus, What's my, what am I experiencing in terms of the building at this point? Am I, I'm coming up on something where I can look east and I, I can see through it. Um, but in terms of um, the changes that were made, I was trying to track the changes from the previous uh, concept review. You know, Adrian, I know your office is right there. What is that experience for me going east, going south? And then what is that experience for me going east, knowing that we, had a good time bashing uh, canyon, uh, canyon uh, pedestrian experience at the concept meeting. Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. Starting right at the corner, there you you can't quite see it in this slide, Sloan. I wonder if uh, slide thirty or slide. Um, let's see. I think slide 30 is probably your best place to start 30 and then 31. Right. So you can see actually uh, that we have an on grade um, coffee shop restaurant facility that we that we don't have a tenant for yet, but uh, we, we created an outdoor dining area associated with that, that you can see the windows doors, they, they the windows open up significantly in the entire the entire Canyon Street side, Canyon Boulevard side, as well as the uh, 15th Street side opens up to outdoor uh, dining and um, uh, sort of bar counter zones for raised seating. I think the next, let me see, the next slide we might want to look at as you walk down is try, Anybody? Okay, let's try. Um, 
Well, there's one. I think it's like 16 is probably a good place to start. Okay. Because you can see, yeah, you can, you see, can see in these slides. Yeah, so you can see in the left there, the, uh, the coffee shop and then transitioning to an outdoor dining area, an outdoor seating area that is not controlled necessarily by the coffee shop restaurant, but is part of the outdoor seating area adjacent to the entry and the, and the entry canopy, which is not exactly connected to the building, but adjacent to it because of the floodplain issues. Uh, and the entry of, of adjacent to it that leads through visually to the uh, courtyards beyond as you go past the reception area. Uh, to the right of that, to the, to the south of that, um, is a landscape zone that, that um, holds a lot of uh, on-site bike parking, actually. And that shows up, I believe, in the site plan, but it's got a yellow, yellow haze over it. But um, just south of the entry. And, and that, that whole zone is landscape separated from the, the, the widened sidewalk area. South of that are some rain gardens that address uh, drainage off of the roof. And then south of that still is the drive access into the, uh, the garage below. South of that garage entry is another rain garden and landscape zone. Uh, those rain gardens, I'm sure Carol uh, can speak to in terms of what we're doing there. And then south of that is the bike path that connects westward uh, up the white, white Rock Ditch and hopefully someday further east as well. And if you don't mind, Adrian, I'll just jump in and talk a little bit about the retail one, you know, the primary retail space on the corner of uh, 15th and Canyon, and then how that space internally transitions into what we're looking at calling somewhat of a flex space. And then you have the entry point into the residential proper, which looks through into the courtyards. And then after that, you have the amenity spaces for the um, tenants. With You'll have things like um, co-working spaces, shared spaces. There's a fitness zone right at the back of that. At the southernmost part of that plan, you can see on slide uh, 16. So, so the idea is to have a fully and, and then separated uh, retail space on the corner that that uh, core has a relationship with. And then so that retail space can actually open up into what we call the flex space, which is the next resale, retail space back. And then so just in front of the retail flex space is an outdoor dining area or relaxing space where residents and um, retail people start to mingle and interact. So there's a bit of a blending going on there. And then that happens not only on the outdoor space, but also inside, inside the lobby slash flex retail space. And then as you move down further again, it kind of moves into a more private area. But the whole experience is, is supposed to feel more like a hotel lobby where you, you walk into the space and to to the right or to the, facing towards the south, you would see a, more of a, um, a you know like a business center, a uh, relaxing space, and then to the left you have a kind of shared coffee space that opens out onto the um, onto the outdoor spaces, and then uh, you, further to the left again you'll see the retail activity that um, is is a fully you know like a um, casual casual dining and coffee and, and drinks like that. So, so then that fully operates on the corner. So I'm sorry, but Ty was rightly pointing out the interior space reflects the activity in the exterior space. Yeah. And so also as you go further south into the, the interior lobby reception area, you have the, the, the indoor amenities, also which the windows open up to that outdoor uh, green space, that the pollinator garden, and the, the, the rain gardens that are associated with that zone. Yeah, and, and we've used those operable windows to um, not only at the retail on the corner and then at the flex space, but then again on the other side of the residential lobby and the amenity spaces, those again open out 
and you have these tabletops there so you could sit there and work on your laptop or have a coffee and you're looking out the window and then in front of that amenity space you'll see an outdoor seating area that you can uh, bring people into it, it's 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 somewhat private because it's kind of nestled in as part of the residential experience and it's kind of um, somewhat screened from the street with some planting but because you know you have these common spaces i mean well the the public space is just north of that there's a kind of natural flow so if you're intermingling with residents there's nothing stopping you from also from public people using those um residential spaces as well but there's this kind of intermingling of the public and and the residents so you know um there's not like this is mine and that is yours. It's there's a kind of a, de a gradient of blending and mixing of different so, occupants and users. So one other thing I'll just add is that the second and third floor in that zone, they're generally smaller units, they're uh, efficiencies. And so there's a, there's a lot of exterior balconies associated with each of those efficiencies. They each have one. So they have a lot of outdoor space that also looks into the 15th street zone which increases the activity in the eyes on that portion of the street. Thank you. Okay, um, Peter, is that good? Yes, thank you very much, both uh, Ty and Adrian. Okay, then uh, call on Lisa, please. Yeah, so I'll kind of piggyback off that uh, comment. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'd love to hear more about those outdoor spaces associated with the units, especially the efficiency units. Um, kind of a little more about the square footage, how they work, how they're accessed, shared, unshared, I'd, I'd just like to hear more about those. Ty, uh, you want to take that? Sure. So the, um, I, th I think if we're looking at uh, slide 16, you'll see those balconies uh, facing out onto 15th. Those are predominantly studios looking out onto there, and you can see how we've, we've uh, screened to a certain degree with these. Uh, it's a continuation of the rhythm that we did on 15th Street. And then, you know, one balcony is slightly protected from the next and, and each balcony is uh, entered and they're, they're private and they're entered from the units. Uh, they're approximately 60 square feet. I think they're in the range of 60 to 65, but they're, they're all certainly over 60 square feet, which is the minimum required. So I think the, the, the point is also that it keeps the rhythm of the, of the public street that Ty was pointing to on Canyon. We're maintaining that same kind of sort of variegated rhythm, but we, we, they're all essentially the same kind of unit. We played with the, the way the balcony was expressed in order to maintain that rhythm. So they're, they're balcony, 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 instead of balcony, not balcony, balcony, not balcony. Sorry, and then the rooftops as well. Could you speak to that kind of the shared? Are those shared? Yes, the the rooftop uh, balcony. Uh, sorry, the rooftop terrace is a is a shared space. Um, and if we go to, excuse me for a second. I think if we go to slide um, thirty one. No, here we go. Twenty two. Slide twenty two. So you can see on there, it's, it's, we've cut out a corner of uh, the building on the corner of 15th and Canyon. I, I think this has helped too. It's dropped, dropped the effective height at the corner. But instead of creating a weaker corner when we do that, and you can see it unfortunately in this render just in the background, what we've done is maintain that, that three level expression with the, the same kind of rectangular ex extruded rectangle that we've used elsewhere. But instead of this being an indoor space, what we've done is use that as a, um, a, a cabana or Kubota, um, yeah, cabana, a cabana type space, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so underneath there we'll have um, outdoor seating and tables so you can relax and lounge there. And then in front of that, you'll step up in a series of kind of terraces up onto uh, 
a larger area where you have a hot tub that's looking out towards the uh, flat irons. And so the, the areas close to the 15th street are more for relaxing and lounging back there. And then as you move up onto the higher points, you're more looking out to the views and um, you know, relaxing in the hot tub, what have you. Cool, thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and uh, ask a little bit more about, um, I think I, I'm satisfied with what staff said about the uh, 500 year flood, but um, since we do have below grade uh, residential units, are there, is there a need for um, like a sump pump uh, facility to keep the foundation dry enough uh, for those units? Uh, and if so, does that uh, need to discharge some, uh, is, is there um, any regulations around where it discharges? So um, Matt Emmett from JVA, I think we'll start to address this question. I think slide number 37 and 38 might be best, Sloan. Start with 37. All right, thank you. I'm Matt with JVA in Boulder, 1319 Spruce Street. And the section that you're seeing there is a, a section through the ditch on uh, the south side. And it shows in the ditch section there where the 100 year floodplain elevation is. And the way we've uh, designed the area wells that are associated with the, the lower units is that they're well above the 100 year floodplain elevation. Um, the threshold of the parking garage, too, is above the 100-year floodplain elevation. And um, we've also explored the idea of um, a waterproof gate, basically, at, at the threshold entry to the parking garage. So, and we've worked closely with the city staff to evaluate uh, just the footprint of the building. Um, one, as it's... Um, situated in the delineated floodplain or the regulated floodplain, which is what's uh, shown in, in the blue thick line there. But we also worked with Anderson Consulting Engineers, which is a floodplain engineer, um, which they did the Civic Area Park. Um, so they're, they're very familiar with this basin, all the flows that go down and around through this neighborhood. And uh, we gave our grading files to them and they modeled how the changes to the site that we're proposing would change that floodplain delineation. So we provided um, the ultimate build out um, floodplain limit line, which also the building is outside of that. And we coordinated that uh, with the floodplain administrator, Kristen Shepard. Okay, I, and yeah, I just, um, I, I understand all, all of that and that sounds great. I just was wondering, uh, even though uh, an, a below grade um, unit may not be in the floodplain, still sometimes there might be, you know, uh, seepage issues and things like that. I just wondered if it requires anything like some pumps or anything, or uh, uh, just because that can, it's just, uh, it's, it's something that I know some you sometimes have to plan for, and maybe you don't, and that's fine. I just was curious. I don't know, Adrian or, or Rob, if you, want to speak to that from a, an MEP standpoint and uh, pumps that may be used for any sort of garage level uh, discharge? Well, we do have, we do have, uh, we do have some requirements or discharge requirements for the garage itself related to uh, oil sand separators and so on, but we are designing this as a essentially a bathtub design so that the, the perimeter walls that you see are designed to, to, to keep water out uh, and not have it come in. Now, if we did have a sump pump to get water out in the case of a flood, say a 500 year flood, all you're doing is pumping that water back into the flood. Right. It's not gonna go anywhere. So that doesn't solve the, the extent of flood that may be required uh, to be addressed in 500 years, but that's, beyond the, the scope of the requirement that we're, we're, we're needing to meet. Right. 
Okay, that's that's. Uh, it sounds. I, I understand that you have a design that, uh, that is going to keep the water out by design. But I just was was curious about that. Thank you. Sure. Sarah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm just wondering if someone on the team could uh, clarify for me um, the alternative transportation fund. Um, how it's going to work and whether it is available, you know, with EcoPass, for example, you're only required to provide it for the first three years of a building's life. Um, and since this is a rental, I just want to understand, um, will the fund be available to anyone who rents for however long this building stands as a rental? Uh, and how will the tran alternative transportation fund system, um, I'm sorry, fund work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one, Sarah. So um, you know, what we've been discussing with staff, um, you know, particularly as regards to our, our TDM plan, ha have been really those two elements uh, in addition to a lot of the other elements that we're talking about. But to address those, um, what we've been talking about for the, uh, the transportation subsidy would be setting up an account essentially where um, you know, we would be allocating $50 um, you know, through that account and uh, be able to refund tenants for that. Uh, and it, you know, we are looking at doing it in perpetuity, um, but we have you know, worked out with staff that um, you know, if we sometime get to a point where it's no longer being used or, or no longer effective, um, you know, we will reevaluate at that point. Um, so, so that's how we're, we're looking at that. And um, with the NICO bus, uh, NICO pro, uh, bus pass program, um, <laughs> we have, we've committed to, to three years uh, there as well. So we will, um, you know, following that three years, uh, we'll have open lines of communication with staff and, uh, you know, or actually like the, the city department. So uh, we'll be able to kind of further evaluate at that time and, and, and see, you know, what the usage is. Uh, we, we have committed to uh, surveys and, um, you know, working through that with staff. So we'll, uh, for both of those, the plan is to keep in constant communication and uh, you know, further evaluate them and their success moving forward. And will the, is it $50 per resident or per unit? Uh, we, we propose $50 per unit. Okay, thank you. John? Yeah, just to follow up on what Sarah was uh, inquiring about the transit uh, transportation arrangement, it sounds to me like the uh, what you've just described means that that the applicant retains control over what happens in two or three years and if if the applicant decides it's inappropriate to keep providing 50 bucks per unit that that that's the end of it is, is that the case who who's in control uh no uh it, it would be on us to prove that it's not you know so we, we would just be you know open and honest and show that it's either being used or not being used in open lines of communication so uh, the way that it's written in our TDM report is essentially that um, you know, we would need to prove that it's that it's being greatly underutilized. So, um, you know, in, in effect, it's you know the city controlling it uh, with for the project going forward. So the so it would be city staff who who makes decisions about changes to that program and your obligations. Is that correct? Uh, essentially, yes. Thank you. Lupita, go right ahead. Thank you. So I stayed a little bit quiet today. I'm not feeling so well. But I, um, I do have a question regarding, I really like the, the views from Canyon. And I can envision the businesses that came or that come to this area will probably have a lot of traffic and, and hopefully good business. So I'm thinking in terms of, as you were designing this uh, attractive fronts, what kind of business did you have envisioned and how what you're envisioning may or may not be impacted by the changes we're seeing because of coronavirus, uh, essentially requ requiring the many of these businesses really spilled out a lot into the uh, outdoor areas. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really great point. And, and, and to be honest, we, we're really evaluating all of the impacts, uh, you know, that we're all seeing, uh, you know, across a lot of our other operating properties, um, you know, that we're looking at right now. But, 
Um, you know, typically what, what we feel, feel is a great accompaniment to, to our tenant base and, and to the communities that we're in is, is typically a, a food and beverage offering. Um, so, you know, we really like the idea of restaurants that have outdoor seating. So you saw in the, those renderings, um, we're, we're, we've proposed uh, some improved land or hardscape along the front end of the retail. Uh, so we're hoping that there's outdoor seating that spills out. Um, and if it is a, a typical um, hard goods retailer or, or something of like that, they could have outdoor displays that spill onto the sidewalk on Canyon and really sort of activate that space. Um, so it, it'll be a, a diverse mix. We, we haven't started marketing this by any means. So, you know, we don't really know yet by any means, but, um, you know, we think it's a, you know, the, the visibility from Canyon and the vehicular passerby, uh, the, the kind of wide sidewalk and, and bike path we're doing along Canyon, I think it's going to be a really great retail experience uh, that even wraps, like I said, wraps down 15th as well. So, um, you know, we, we we're pretty excited about it. Okay. Anything else? Any other applicant questions? Okay. All right. Thank you um, to the applicant. Um, you guys can take a break. We're going to go to public comment on this matter, and I'm going to turn it over to Jean to manage public comment. Thank you, Jean Getza. Great. Thank you, Harmon. Yes, same um, same drill as we did earlier. Um, if folks would like to speak in the public hearing, please use the raise hand function. I see at least three folks have done that. Um, and I will remind folks that um, under our rules, accordance with the meeting rules, we do need full name associated with each person participating in the meeting. So if you plan to participate in the open public comment, unfortunately, I can't unmute you until you um, without your full name. So um, if folks look like Chip is signed up, if Chip, if you would mind um, either um, using the rename function to add your full name, or you can send that to me in the chat and I can do that. Okay, we have three minutes each for the public hearing. Um, and I will, Cindy's got the timer going on. We have Don Poe, Lynn Siegel, and Joan Dardis um, to start. And Don, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, my name's Don Poe, and you've heard me speak before, and I also spoke at the city council meeting about this property as well. And does this meet the parking reduction criteria? And I'd, I would counsel that it does not. Uh, I'm the owner of the building across the street on 15th, and I was not notified via mail, nor was I notified of the neighborhood conversation. Uh, though uh, Adrian down the street, we're all neighbors, uh, but I have some issues. Uh, city council did want this broken up into two buildings to help allow for a north-south flow and, and reduce of the massing. It is a pretty building, but that was actually one of the things that council requested. Uh, as I stated, my building's directly across the street on 15th. I've been there since 1997. I know a building's going to go up here and I'm excited to have some new restaurants. And I think overall this looks great, but I have two uh, things I'd like to discuss. Traffic issues and reduction in parking. Uh, the traffic light at 15th Street and Canyon can't handle the traffic. I've been here since 97, 23 years. And there are just, if there's just two or three cars at 15th Street, I routinely don't make it through the first cycle. So looking at the timing and the details of the traffic studies they were done, um, they're limited in scope, uh, the timings of when they were taken. And it's not actually accurate to what happens because I live, I am there every day. Maybe not right now with working from home. Uh, but there's more to know than what the study found. And I routinely experience a level of service of E or F already, not C as what they forecast it'll be when we have maybe 600 more people living here. 15th Street has high school thoroughfare here. So there's lots and lots of students walking through here and lots and lots of cars going down 15th Street. So 15th Street will also have that new bike path along the south side of the building. Uh, and so that's also going to uh, compete with uh, traffic on this road. So how do we solve this issue? Adrian even mentioned this, that there was uh, issues with parking entrance on 15th Street. They tried to move it about 20 feet down the road, but really the entry and exit should be on 16th Street where the entry for the loading and commercial access already is. Let's put it all on one side. That'll help with the high school students. 16th Street has far less traffic already and can take the brunt of this traffic and avoid the high schoolers. It also moved the parking entrance further away from the flood floodplain. So item number two, 
the reduction in parking spots. Monthly, my company has uh, individuals that ask to come rent from our parking lot because we do have our own spots. Uh, there's only one spot required per unit. But with up to four bedrooms in a unit, there could easily be you know, multiple people living in each room, uh, bedroom. There could be like 600 people living uh, in the residential part. And that's over 102 different parking spots. That's about a four or 500 car potential overflow. So the proposal talks about using city lots. There's a multi-year wait to use those parking lots. I know my company has about a, is, is on the waiting list and we're about four years out from getting another city parking spot. It'll be years, literally years until this whole building gets one single parking spot available from the city. It mentions that there'll be car shares available too. Now that car share needs a place to park somewhere too, further reducing the number of the parking spots that are available down in the basement. It says that we're, um, there's one other building that uh, planning board approved uh, uh, on 15th street in that big parking lot. And that also has a reduction in parking. So where are those people gonna park? Where are the people in this building gonna park? If there's standards set for reason, why are they never followed? So I think we should put the exit onto 16th street and this building needs to be required to have more parking spots. Thank you, Don. Okay, next up um, is Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you can go ahead and unmute. 60 square feet. How do you put a kitchen in a bathroom and a living area in 60 square feet? Um, we're talking about a bedroom occupancy issue that's highly debated in this community. Efficiency living units drive up the cost. And, and there's the two, the two bedrooms and the ELUs are the highest unit number in this project. And efficiency living units drive up the cost of everything in this community. The land value, it's really high because what they charge, what are, and what are all the charges for all these different um, um, uh, units in this place? Um, this is just uh, on steroids, um, this whole development. Um, it, it's lovely, Adrian, it's beautiful. It, it's, not, it's not feasible anymore. Our, our economy is contracted by one third in the United States in the last quarter, Glo globally, worldwide. There's people starving all over and you're building these ultra, ultra luxury things. This is why Harmon, the community is so angry. This is not helping our global situation or our local situation in Boulder. This violates the jobs housing imbalance. It's jobs of high-end jobs for high-end apartments and efficiency living units that drive the need for bank clerks and grocery stores. Liquor Mart was a grocery store. You know what this space needs to be? A grocery store. That's what this space needs to be. 15-minute neighborhoods. That's what you're all working towards. What, how can you any of you planning board members even be looking at this lot with, it, it, with rearranging minute details. This whole thing is completely unconscionable. How can you even think of this kind of stuff? I'm stunned. You know, the more new housing that you build, you, you need to repurpose. Pre-existing housing is the most valuable commodity in this community. Every time you're building this brand new stuff, it's like Black Lives Matter goes straight down the hole. There's all of the people that are suffering in, you know, and underappreciated in Boulder. The homeless gets driven up massively and yet you're building as fast as you can to create more homelessness and more demand for low-end housing, for affordable housing, and it needs to be at least 
affordable to go with 40% unaffordable because it drives up the demand for services and the service jobs don't pay. They can't live in this community. They're thrown out. How can you even be looking at a project like this, even be dreaming or imagining it? No way. And I completely agree with Don, Don on the transportation issues, but that's a side issue. Thank you, Lynn. This is, I'm not gonna say it again, unconscionable. Thank you, Lynn. Next up, we have Joan Dardis, then Susan Lott. Joan, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Almost. How can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is this is Michael Dardis. I'm Joan's husband. I have two quick questions. One on the earlier plan, there was going to be a pool on the top. Has the pool been replaced by the hot tub, or is there going to be both both a hot tub and a pool? And secondly, uh, for the 147 units, I can think this is only going to be housing for the CU students. In your marketing, in your plans, what, what is your expectation for the percentage rental units that will be from CU students? That's my qu two questions. So this isn't a question and answer, but if the applicant took notes as to those last couple of questions, they have three minutes that they can use to answer those questions in rebuttal. They're asking about a fucking hot tub and they can't even answer that. So if you could um, restate the name again, we, we missed it for the notes. Shall I repeat? Yes. Your, your name, please. This is Michael Dardis. This is uh, Joan Dardis. I'm, our, I'm the husband. Okay. Thank you so much. We just missed that for the notes. Um, again, and, um, since this isn't an, a, a back and forth question and answer, if you could, you can state your questions and then um, the applicants and the board members um, can reply once the public hearing is, is finished. Okay. I have two questions. One, uh, on one of the earlier plans, can you hear me now? On one of the earlier plans, there was, there was a pool scheduled to be on the top building. Has that been replaced by the hot tub or is it gonna be both a hot tub and a pool? And secondly, in the marketing of these units, it seems to me as if it's strictly gonna be a, a CU student accommodation. In your marketing, what is your percentage expectation of renting to CU students? Those are my two questions. Great, thank you. Um, the applicant can answer those questions if the applicant so chooses. Um, do we have any more public commenters, Jean? We do. We have um, Susan Lott, um, who's up next, and then Chip. Hi, this is Susan Ayat. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, I, my name is Susan Iott, I O T T, and I live at oh, 1711 okay. Grove Street. I want to say thank you very much to Adrian and uh, the applicant for including so much of the community's comments, the neighborhood's comments. I live in Goss Grove and have been part of the um, back and forth, and I uh, really do appreciate the change in design. It, it's a, a much nicer building, and um, and the moving of the uh, pool and hot tub to the northwest corner. Um, 
So it still is a very big building. And I think we all realize it will be. Uh, that's just going to be the nature of building on this lot. Um, I, I want to point out three things. Um, uh, in reading through the um, ad addressing the, the comments, I saw that a number of trees will be removed on the south side uh, on the bike path. Um, and that was part of the buffer for the neighborhood uh, from noise from the balconies. Um, I know now that those are the multi-story um, units and um, they will still have porches. Uh, there's still some concern in the neighborhood about noise coming from those porches and lights. <laughs> and uh, the trees are to be kind of a buffer there and I saw a number of those would be removed. So I um, am hoping that we can keep more trees in that um, area as we clean up that landscape. A second point is that um, the eco pass, I read that it is, will only be for, uh, provided for three years. And so if that's part of the plan for um, reducing the parking, it should be in perpetuity. Um, and then I think I feel compelled to add, um, while I know that the, the regulatory aspects of the floodplain have been addressed, um, Boulder is trying to be a resilient community and address climate change. And uh, in addressing climate change, we have to look at forward looking climate information, not historic. And I read that we're dealing with the historic floodplain and that is the floodplain that the Corps approved. And so in thinking about how it is that we're protecting those lower units from, from floods, we have to think about future floodplains, not current or historic floodplains. And so, um, again, I will just emphasize that we are a climate community and we are trying to be forward thinking. FEMA had included the idea of addressing um, future flooding in their regulations, but that got pulled back by the current administration. I think Boulder needs to be an example of what it means to be a resilient climate community. Um, and I am just raising that in the spirit of Gilbert White, who has uh, in his history tried to make us a, a flood resilient community. So thank you. Um, thank you though. Overall, the building is uh, much improved and a much nicer addition to the community. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. Oh, no worries. It always happens. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And our last speaker is Chip. Chip has indicated that that is their full name. So Chip, you may go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. This is Chip. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Downtown Boulder Partnership. And I want to express uh, my enthusiasm for this project for a number of reasons, uh, many little reasons and, and one big reasons. I think it's a very appropriate uh, and exciting use of this space. I think the relationship to the neighborhood uh, presents a lot of opportunities. I'm, I'm particularly thoughtful about the uh, the civic area on the east bookend opportunities there and how this project re relates to that. I feel like it's a very thoughtful and intelligent design. I, I um, concur with the previous speaker, the, the adaptation since the initial uh, meeting, at least the initial meeting I uh, witnessed have been really um, responsive and I really appreciate the design changes. Um, but the, the big reason is uh, just the the businesses in the downtown have been really feeling the effects of the loss for better or worse the loss of our in commuters uh, it's particularly the restaurants and retail and uh, the office users downtown who are going away and I feel uh, that creating more housing in and around the downtown and in Boulder is, is particularly important right now um, so I'm, I'm very excited to see this project and that it will bring a few more residents into our downtown um, I do have a, a couple of thoughts. I, I would in, encourage the, the project to continue to look at the possibility of affordable housing on site. If I understood Adrian's uh, point, the, the, one of the drawbacks was the parking uh, inability to connect the parking uh, on the sites. I think if there's ways to work around that or uh, further reduce the parking, I am, you know, I believe that reduce, reducing the parking is probably a, a reasonable uh, thing to do at this moment. However, I would also say it would be great to connect those parking reductions uh, to kind of codify the use of the tenants. So uh, passing on some of the savings of that to tenants who 
who commit to not having a single use vehicle or, or having a car or really being more aggressive on codifying the TDM uh, in the parking and creating that. Uh, generally, I think it's a very exciting project. I'm enthused. My biggest complaint is it can't happen sooner. Um, and I, I really look forward to meeting our new neighbors downtown. So thank you for your time and consideration. That's all I got. Thank you, Chip. Um, I see no other hands raised at the moment. So if anyone else would like to um, speak for this, in, in this public hearing, please raise your hand now. Seeing none, Harmon, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Cindy, can you take the camera or the uh, timer down, please? And uh, like to give it back to the applicant team if they Try. want to for rebuttal. Thank you, um, board. I, I, I'm not quite sure what to say. I think there's some some confusion about some of the things that we're that we're doing. Uh, firstly, I, I can speak to some of the if you if the board wishes me to. I'm not quite sure it's rebuttal so much as clarification. The parking requirement. Uh, for the commercial side of things is really covered under the CAGED numbers. We are not required to put any commercial parking in. Um, the, the, the limitations on or, and requirements for, for residential parking is one car per unit. If there is more cars that are desired by residents, they're not going to be able to bring them. There's no place for them to go. They cannot park in the city parking lots. They cannot park in the city structures because that's not what it's intended for. That's what the on-site parking for is for, and that is what the reduction, the parking reduction is in request of, is to actually lower the number because we don't anticipate or desire to have people bring their cars. We can talk about this in more detail if you wish. The other question in relation to the level of service of 15th versus, versus 16th, I think if we push the parking access to 16th Street, you'd have a lot of 16th Street neighbors complaining about it. If you look at the access to parking historically from, from Liquor Mart, it's way more than what you're seeing. And by the way, I've been a, a resident tenant 25 years on this block. I'm looking at Mr. Uh, Ensign sitting right outside right now because um, I'm looking out that window right at him. And believe me, there's not a car on the street and hasn't been much for hours. The level of activity on the street on 15th is nowhere near what, what is, is being implied by those statements. I don't want to argue about it. I think we have our traffic engineer that can address it more effectively if the board wishes us to. Uh, I'm sorry, there's, there's, there's tree issues. We have, I, I think maybe it's better if the board asks us questions because we have our, our staff, our team of landscape architects, civil engineers, and down the line. So maybe I should stop before I get too carried away. Any final thoughts for the applicant before we uh, wrap up the public hearing? Oh, one more thing about affordable housing, Chip, is that uh, we would have to separate out and have an affordable housing developer take that parcel. And, and I, our experience on affordable housing in this town right now is anything less than 50 units is not supportable as a rental project. We cannot get an affordable housing partner in this town right now for if it's 40, we can have a discussion, but we haven't had anything to make work. And we spent a year on Shining Mountain trying to make that happen and nothing happened without less than 50 units. All right, then. Adrian, anything else? Does anyone else want to add anything from the team, Rob, on, um, uh, yeah, there, there were two comments, just a clarification on the two questions from um, Michael Dardis. Uh, so yeah, we, we had originally proposed a, a pool and a hot tub up on that, that third level amenity deck, but it is a really relatively small space. So we, we really want to maximize um, got a more casual seating area. So we've you know, ditched the idea of a pool and it's a, a much smaller hot tub now. Um, so I think it's a much more appropriate design uh, to take advantage of those amazing views back to the mountains. So I think it's gonna be really, really amazing space. Um, and and on, on the, the question of you know, who we're marketing to and you know, who's going to be here, the percentage of students, um, you know, it's by no means lost on us that we are in close proximity to CU uh, as well. So um, while we are you know, designing our units towards a, 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 like a, a true market rate product, 
Um, you know, I'm sure we will have some students here. Uh, we, we won't know that until we actually start, you know, start signing leases here if we're ultimately approved and, and move through the process. But, um, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, our, our goal here is to, you know, make this a true market rate and, and open to, um, you know, all, all different types of, of renters and, and those that are attracted to the location. And, and really, that I think it's the close proximity to downtown is, is what we're most focused on and the feedback we've gotten from our, our focus groups that we've conducted over the past couple of years uh, you know, directly in Boulder there, so. Thanks uh, to the applicant team. I think you guys are out of time for final thoughts. So I'm gonna close the public hearing. And um, given that it is uh, close to 8.40, uh, before board starts deliberating, I'm gonna propose that we hold a short break um, and then get to deliberations. So um, let me see what my official clock says, 8.36. Um, how about we come back at 8.45 uh, on the button, 15 of nine. Uh, I'll give you nine minutes, eight minutes now. It's 8.37 and we'll see you then.
like we are almost back. Okay, so what we're doing here is deliberating as to the site review that we just saw a presentation and heard public comment about. Um, does anybody want to start with any general comments or should we dive into the key issues? So uh, seeing no general comments, let's uh, dive into key issue number one in the staff report. And for this one, which is, does the project meet the applicable site review criteria in section 9214H of the code? Um, it's probably useful to keep in mind the, uh, the different modifications that the project is asking for. Does anybody have uh, any comments that they want to lead off with about this one? David? Yeah, I mean, if no one else wants to start, I'll be glad to. Um, I, I think that um, when we look at these kinds of modifications, we need, really need to take into account uh, the positioning of the site and look at um, the different streetscapes that are being created. Uh, and I do feel that, um, that the, there are very natural uh, streetscapes on each side of the building. Uh, and so um, I think that it meets the site review criteria from that standpoint. And I agree with staff that um, the, the project meets this site criteria in general. Um, I, I'll go ahead and talk about some, um, a few of the uh, BVCP um, criteria uh, since that kind of fits under here. Um, first of all, um, uh, I, 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 I think that uh, the design is good. Um, many of the planning board comments were addressed actually even before the city council call up uh, a year and a half ago or however long ago that was. Uh, the third floor offset on the south, uh, the relocation of the roof deck are good adjustments. Uh, I think um, just from a, a permeability standpoint, I do not agree that a mid block north to south connector would be a good idea. I don't think that that would set a reasonable precedence. Uh, I think that the view through the courtyards was a nice touch uh, to uh, create some, uh, some visual permeability, uh, but I just don't really see the uh, value in asking uh, uh, projects like this to try to create some sort of a north-south uh, mid-block uh, connectivity. So I think I, think, uh, I support that. Um, Let's see, I, I was gonna make a comment on inclusionary housing uh, because uh, that came up a lot in the city council call up as well. Um, I do think that, um, you know, of course we all um, can comment on, uh, on, on wanting to see uh, on-site inclusionary housing, uh, but we will, you know, we know that without it, we do get the cash in lieu that can be used for very powerful uh, 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 inclusionary housing projects uh, outside of this particular uh, proposal. So um, that is a criteria that, that the criteria has to be met one way or the other and it is being met. Uh, I'll also just comment quickly that I'm just very impressed that, um, uh, that there was um, a neighbor, um, Susan, thank you for speaking to us on behalf of Goss Grove uh, commenting on how well uh, the applicant has addressed uh, neighbor concerns. I think uh, th that's really a testament to um, listening. I think the pollinator garden specifically is, is something to highlight because it is something that is important to people in, in the area and it will connect uh, pollinator uh, types of plants from Goss Grove where they're working on it all the way up through the Civic Center site where we have a lot of pollinator plants. So I think that it's nice to see uh, Boulder values being embodied. Thanks, David. And and I saw right around when you raised your hand, uh, Lisa had also. So Lisa, if you'd like to speak, please. Yeah, I think I'd probably um, have had a lot more to say with the earlier iteration of this product, but as others have commented on, um, and as staff comment on a lot of things seem to have been addressed with this modified um, plan. So it's great to see 
Um, I was going to say that I also appreciate the modifications to the facade, particularly um, the ways that the balconies were used and that the um, rooftop kind of shared space was used to reduce the impact of the third story in certain ways to kind of step down uh, into the neighborhood into Goss Grove um, and otherwise kind of deal with the massing. Um, I'm curious to see what other members of the board say, but based on uh, the heights that we see in this area and given the amount of traffic we see on Canyon and the way it steps down, um, it feels appropriate to me. Uh, I also really appreciated bringing um, the building forward and kind of reestablishing that pedestrian walkable site and the commitment to complete streets um, such that if at some point we get the funding and the ability to do that, that we can put a dedicated um, bike lane in there or uh, other um, adjustments to kind of build out the complete street. Um, also appreciate the questions around uh, what was being done in terms of the bathtub with that ditch right behind um, and with potential, in well, pretty much guaranteed increases in major weather events and getting a lot of water very fast. Um, I think it's true that we're gonna have all kinds of interesting things to face if we start seeing really major shifts in flooding, but uh, that seems like an appropriate uh, approach to dealing with um, what we know about what we might see in terms of flooding. Uh, and I know they can do good stuff with void forms and so on with that. Um, and then also, I just wanted to touch on the fund for TDM uh, and the fact that that can be used in really interesting and creative ways um, uh, that I think SoferStorm might be familiar with. Um, I'm thinking over at Boulder Junction, just in terms of incentivizing residents um, to choose not to drive or to choose alternative transport. You can do some gamification around that, that um, in competition and, and other stuff that kind of encourages people to behave in interesting ways. Um, uh, so hopefully that's something that is being looked at for long-term management. Um, TDM incentives, pedestrian environments. I think that covers a lot of what, what I was uh, thinking, but yeah, it's, it's good to see. And um, I appreciate the parking reduction and then would also just encourage kind of watching what kind of demands are you seeing from tenants and what can you use to communicate to them about what they should expect in terms of on-site parking, um, what's actually available in KGID, um, and then how to kind of incentivize whatever behaviors you're looking for in that. So thanks. Seeing nobody jumping up, okay, Sarah, go ahead. I'm and sorry, Harmon, I didn't, I didn't mean to keep you from speaking. No, no, that's fine. You go ahead and then John and then I'll go. Okay, thank you. Um, so I do appreciate uh, what the applicant has brought to us. Um, and I'm actually gonna just, in my estimation, um, the, the mass of the building um, actually does not um, meet the uh, requirements of 9-2-14 HF uh, Roman numeral one. Um, which is not to say I don't really appreciate the, the uh, way you all have tried to use architecture to break up that, that massive scale, that massive building. Um, I'm just, I, I just wanted to plant a flag a bit because it concerns me that we will see more very, very big um, buildings that are not really human scaled in the sense that the downtown design guidelines um, are, are hoping to produce. Um, and that's my comment. John? Yes, uh, I uh, had just a couple questions which I probably should have asked staff previously, but uh, would like to clarify now, and it may be of interest to all of you. One of them is uh, in, it, there's a note in the memo that the applicant is seeking to establish statutory vested property rights uh, for this site review, if it's approved. And I was, I didn't recall having seen that language in previous applications. And I w just wondered if, if Hella or, or staff could tell us if that's uh, something unusual or something that is a normal part of this uh, application. Um, and I can so address I the rights question, John. 
Um, vested rights is something that applicants always have to consider when a use review or a site review is filed. It's kind of a statutory process that's established through Colorado state law and applicants are allowed to request this provided certain procedure is followed for the review in approved site plans and approved use reviews. And one of those requirements to establish the vested rights is to have a public hearing. So when vested rights are um, requested, um, applicants projects will automatically be forwarded to the board. So that's really your connection with it. The request for vested rights doesn't in any other way change your review of the project. And what it does is it gives the applicant some protections against changes to the standards that this uh, project was reviewed against that may happen after um, the application is filed. And I think in common law, there's already a lot of protection that exists for projects. So in, in me personally, I think it doesn't add a lot to request vested rights to what's already existing under common law. And I think that's why we don't see it very often. So when an applicant files an application, they always have to fill out a form if they are seeking vested rights or if they're waiving that. And most applicants waive it, but some some applicants request it. So, so is this something that we should be considering in our analysis here? Or does it, uh, from your explanation, it sounds like it doesn't really affect our decision or analysis here, although yeah. it's part of the staff recommendations. Um, it's not, I think it's just an informational note to you, but it doesn't change the review criteria. Um, so to establish them, they, certain things have to be established that the project was actually approved by the planning board and not by staff and that there was a public hearing. So that's what's being um, satisfied right now, should the project be approved. And then there is some follow up. There has to be a newspaper notice. Um, that's what I remember off the top of my head right now. But, but mostly it's just, uh, it has procedural requirements attached to it. It's, it doesn't change the review criteria. So you don't need to think about it in your review today. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, my second question was, uh, I guess for Sloan, and that is, is the parking going to be uh, separated from the rent of apartments so that uh, there's additional charges made if, if a tenant wants to be able to park in this project? Sure, so they are proposing to unbundle the parking from the residential units, so they would have to pay a separate rent for parking. Okay, and that is part of the, that is not something that they can change their mind on later. It, that is part of the, of the project that we're approving. Yeah, it's part of their TDM plan, which is part of their approval package, so they would have to come back and propose to modify that. Okay, thank you. So given, given that, um, just uh, in our discussion, I think I'll be, uh, I'll be, uh, I agree with the staff recommendations. Okay, thanks John. I'm gonna uh, chime in uh, around the modifications specifically. So there are seven modifications being requested altogether and the first, um, Four of them have to do with setback mods. Um, I, I find that the, uh, the building is situated properly on its lot. Um, there's enough space on the front setback, for example, because of the width of Canyon and from a design standard um, to meet the 65 feet from the center line of Canyon, uh, you know, even if it doesn't meet the, uh, the, the setback for the front yard, um, to the property line, it, it really respects the urban design principle of meeting the setback, um, given the, the design sensitive setback that's, uh, that's prescribed for that street. Um, so I, I have no issues with uh, approving the, uh, the various setbacks. Um, just also the, the rear setback, you know, being um, against the, the uh, creek path and, and the way the creek path is treated and addressed 
um, seems sensitive to me and worthy of a, a setback modification. The other three are um, a site review requirement to, uh, to have a site review for three stories where two is, is the by right number of stories in the district. We just saw this at our last planning board meeting on Pearl. Um, the fact that they were able to fit three stories on a building this large into um, 38 feet, uh, especially given the way that we calculate height in the city of Boulder is uh, pretty good. Um, and, and I think I'd rather see three stories within 38 feet than two. I, I think it's also impressive given that they have a, a first floor retail component and retail ceiling heights usually have to be a little taller than residential ones. So that's an, another uh, good design um, by the applicant. Um, totally in favor of a parking reduction. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work done recently about carbon footprint for household um, in, in uh, various places around the country. Berkeley has a, a pretty interesting um, study that's got uh, heavy mapping, uh, if you want to look at it, by zip code. Uh, Michigan just came out with one um, that uh, unfortunately found that Big houses in Western Boulder County have the worst carbon footprint of any zip code in the United States. And um, we, uh, we should all be sad about that, I think. Um, creating density uh, a block from a transportation center that provides the best bus service in the region, that's a no-brainer. If we can get a parking reduction in an area that's uh, right downtown, right by Central Park, right by the bike path, right by employment, uh, we're putting a, a, a bunch of new units in. Um, we should absolutely approve a parking reduction. Um, and uh, finally, I think in the building design, um, uh, the building design modification to allow 28% of the commercial facade to be transparent where 60% is required. Um, you know, I, I think that, there, you know, if you look at Macy's or, or some great uh, you know, famous retail structure, you're not necessarily going to see that 60% of the facade is glass. Um, I'm not saying that it's an arbitrary standard that has no meaning, but, um, but I think if it's an attractive building and it doesn't meet the standard, uh, we're entitled to vary that or not vary that, but modify that. So I, I would totally approve of that modification. So with that, um, going specifically into the different uh, modifications that are being requested, I, I think that the uh, the, the building does meet um, the applicable site review criteria around form and bulk and, and all the other um, standards that are listed in the staff report. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next board member if there are any who, who wanna speak to key issue number one. Shall we move on to key issue number two, John? Yeah, I just gotta make a, a short remark. I, I'm probably the only person in this room who still remembers Joyce's market <laughs> which was uh, there before, before Liquor Mart. And it, when it was built, it was the neatest and most impressive supermarket in the city. And the people, uh, people were really impressed by that. And uh, so it's a sort of a, a, a nostalgic comment about what happened there before now. John, before this is all over, we're gonna get a Back to the Future remake with you as the star and Boulder <laughs> at the backdrop. I love the reminiscence. Um, and unfortunately, according to uh, historic preservation staff, that facade was was so destroyed by years and years of rehab that it wasn't there was nothing left to preserve of it. So well, I wish I, I agree, seen. but uh, just not a comment like that. So. Thank you. Um, any other comments before we move to key issue number two? Okay, staff did a, a, a great job in summarizing the uh, downtown urban design guidelines and how this project meets them in staff's opinion. Um, does anybody have, let, let's maybe just start with an, a negative poll. Does anybody believe that the project does not meet and is not consistent with the downtown urban design guidelines for non-historic and interface areas? If you, if you believe it does not meet the guidelines, just raise your hand. Okay, um, so we've got six people who don't uh, find it out of compliance. And Sarah, would you like to talk to why you find it out of compliance? Yeah, it's the same issue. It's this, um, the 75 foot length of facade. And I, I recognize how the applicant has addressed that. Um, and again, I'm just cognizant of the 
this the size of this the monumentalness of this building and that the downtown design guidelines are trying are, are intended as far as I as I understand them having read them several times uh, to try to get away from that kind of um, scale and I also appreciate what the applicant has done to try to address that. So I'm not, um, I'll get to you in a sec, Lisa. I'm not um, necessarily disagreeing with you, Sarah. I, I think that uh, it would be useful, given that facade isn't defined in the definitions in the code, to, um, to find out if uh, we interpret the word facade to mean um, the, the length of a building. And the only way to achieve the 70 foot, 75 foot or fewer uh, length of, or less length of facade is to actually have a building separation. Or if the facade is, a, is potentially a component of a building and a building can have multiple facades. Um, because I think that's really an important distinction. If, um, if what the requirement or, or the, the, the design guideline means by saying that you need to have facades no, no wider than 75 feet, if that means that you, know, you have to break up a, a large lot that you own into multiple buildings that are no wider than 75 feet, um, that means a lot, something a lot different than um, you just need to break the building up in a maximum of 75 foot chunks. Um, to create some sort of a rhythm and some sort of variety. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to allow staff to address that. Um, and maybe that'll help us think about this. No, I think that the code and um, the design guidelines consider the, the facade an element of a building. So I think- Meaning, meaning the cladding versus, correct. okay. Yeah, versus the actual building length itself. Okay. So I think, you know, with, with that, with that interpretation of how, how to apply the facade requirement of 75 foot max, um, you know, I think the building meets, in, in my mind, it meets that requirement because it breaks up the, the, the facade of the, there are multiple facades of the building that are soldiered down the line. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they're aiming at 25 feet to really be more like a, a townhouse yeah. or yeah. downtown development. Uh, Lisa. Um, so that's what I was going to say. I just wanted to explore what you were talking about a little more, um, Sarah, both in terms of it was very helpful to get that definition of the facade and kind of how the city views it and also um, what it is that's giving you that feeling. So, you know, wh whether it is that it's just the stretch of it or whether it's kind of those repeated townhouse or almost brownstone patterns, you know, they talked a lot about kind of the rhythm of that. Um, and obviously, Pearl Street is a very different application, but I but I think of um, the variation in what I would call facade or you know front of the building along Pearl Street, where it is a solid pedestrian wall, uh, without even this kind of balcony you know or the sight lines necessarily through to courtyards except in a few spots, um, but where you have like an old metal storefront that's painted green and the next one's brick and then the next one's you know something else. Um, so I was just curious what what is it that you feel like is inspiring that reaction is it the length of it is it the the rhythm and the repetitiveness what no it's actually the link it's actually the length of it, it it's just such a it is such a huge building <clears throat> and um i went over to the site uh yet this morning actually uh just to get a sense try to imagine what a building that's like 180 feet on canyon and uh, i can't remember now what the numbers are maybe it's more than 200 feet it's it's a long it's a big building um and there's a lot of um i i the the applicant has done a really admirable job of trying to make that very large building seem quite uh human scaled at the same time it's uh very busy <laughs> there are a lot of um different uh uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, so I'll just use cladding because that's the word that comes to mind. It's just a very, it's, it's very busy. Um, and, and, and in some ways, and this is just an aesthetic comment, uh, not one referencing um, code, um, that 
um, that somehow the busyness doesn't result, doesn't add to the sense of the human scale that I know the architect was going for. So, um, uh, and I, again, just re reiterate what I said earlier. I think what I'm really trying to do is just put on the table for, which will come up in other conversations on other projects is just buildings that are so massive um, really can be quite um, off-putting for the pedestrian experience. And I'd like us to just bear in mind what we can do to um, bring those built, that a building of the size to a more um, human scale. I'm not exactly answering your question, but I'm trying, I'm trying to. <laughs> I appreciate the dialogue. Um, David? Yeah, I, um, I had reserved some of my comments on design for this section because I think um, it, it is appropriate to talk about it. And I, um, I really want to go back to what we saw at Concept Review because um, it was very interesting. Um, there was a, a kind of a polarized reaction to the design that was presented at Concept Review. And I remember I, I actually felt a little bit bad afterwards because I <laughs> I had this moment where I said that it reminded me a little bit of the Justice Center at Sixth Street and Canyon, and then I was like, "Oh, that was really mean." But, <laughs> but, it, but it was those kind of diagonal protrusions that um, I found unsettling, uh, and um, and and maybe something that would be more ominous to look at. And so I um, and I um, when I watched the council reactions too, there were a similar thing. There were like half of the people were, had the similar reaction that I did, and half were like loving, loving the modern aspect of it. I really think that what this this is just a total improvement because it um, it doesn't feel like it was designed by committee like uh, oh we're going to slap this on or slap that on. I think it was a real kind of reimagining of uh, how to break it, you know, how to break up the um, the rhythm and how to make it interesting. So I, I actually had a very positive reaction because I, I suppose because of the negative reaction I had uh, to the other design. And, I, and I'm not an architect, so I, uh, I apologize if I offended anyone back then with that reaction. But uh, but anyway, I I I, uh, I do I, I, I kind of I, re I kind of really love the way that um, sandstone protrusion comes out and kind of wraps around the the roof deck and gives it a little bit of definition and privacy. Uh, so, um, and then I love the um, the the more uh, the the more uh, regular lines in the in the, the patterns. And then the other thing I was just going to mention in key issue number two is that key issue number two does give us some additional criteria beyond uh, BBCP uh, and zoning um, to apply. And um, I, I really want to thank Lisa for bringing up the Canyon Complete Street thing. And I just um, want to just expound on that a little bit because it's an example of, <laughs> of what, what happens when we're under budget constraints. We all want area plans. We all want additional criteria. And Complete Street been, has been put on hold. And we're going to hear a little bit later tonight about another area plan that's being uh, delayed. Uh, these things cost money. Uh, so I, I want to just reiterate to Boulder <laughs> if we can't come up with funding for these uh, important additional criteria that are designed for specific areas, we're going to be relying on the kindness and the goodness of, uh, of, of the people who are putting forth the designs to kind of be in touch with Boulder enough to know what we want, which is great to see. Uh, but um, but that, that's the consequence of not being able to get funding for these, uh, for these additional criteria that we'd like to see based on area. So I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, David. Um, anybody else want to speak to this one, Peter? Uh, are we talking, is this the right place to talk about the long interrupted block? Yeah. Um, so, I think that's fine. You know, <clears throat> go, we were going into coronavirus with a retail problem somewhat, and now it's uh, we have problems all across uh, real estate asset classes. But looking at page 44 of 456, 
it's one of many images, but it's the one I'm looking at. And it's just showing the long interrupted block on Canyon. And no one loves long interrupted blocks, especially in a small mountain town. Uh, but I do appreciate the what's being done on the site. And thinking about an un an advantage of this is the vibrancy that it could actually create, the sense of street level pedestrian activity and energy and the, the outdoor spaces and people shopping and being together, if that happens again, which it will, um, what that kind of density of retail could do for that block that could be one of the consequences, the only positive thing we do get out of an uninterrupted block. So I'd put that forth and that's some, that's a way that I'm swallowing this is that it could create that real awesome, vibrant place that uh, we will not really have anywhere else. You know, we have it on Pearl Street and the pedestrian mall sort of, but it's its own kind of experience there. This could actually be a really, uh, you know, if you're going to go out and you're going to have one walk and you're going to take a, you're going to go out with a friend or you're going to meet someone or you're going to do something, you're like, let's go here. Because you could actually interact with, you know, a dozen different retail operators and that could be your quick little trip. So that's one advantage of it. Uh, otherwise, I like what they've done and moving the pool. I was always worried about the people on Goss Grove and having that above them. And I'm excited about the how they've moved to kind of embrace um, 15th Street and that indentation and what that could become. Okay, Lisa again. Um, I was just wondering, I guess this might be in a moment or two, but from either um, staff or the applicant, I'm, I'm trying to picture, you know, the length of that uninterrupted block where else do we see that? You know, obviously Pearl Street in some ways, I'm, I'm wondering about maybe West Pearl. I, I'm trying to picture um, a similar application, you know, whether it's residential or retail, uh, you know, that we can kind of envision a similar feeling. And it could also be from the board. Well, Financial Alley on the other side of Canyon yeah. that uh, is an example of non-activated But it's not block. active, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adrian? Yeah, well, I think if you go if you go down Pearl Street outside of the mall, uh, if you look at any any block along East Pearl from 15th to 20th Street, you have that. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, you have full block lengths that are uninterrupted and not activated, which I don't think we have any interest in. And um, you know, I think. We've tried to do things on Canyon in the past and we haven't ever been able to take a step to the south side that did anything for the pedestrian realm. Mm -hmm. This is the first chance we actually have been able to pursue it with, a, with, a, with, an, with an applicant, a client that wants to do that. If we don't take advantage of it, I don't know what we're doing here in this town. It's going to take a lot to make Canyon a pedestrian friendly environment. And I think Complete Streets was trying to do that. Uh, we're, we're trying to leave, we will be leaving room for it. We are including a bike path on there now, but it will not be the grade separated one as well as the on, on, um, on street. So uh, things are gonna change over the next few years and they're gonna change again. And, and we're trying to make a situation that actually can work to Boulder's long-term view yeah. of an activated yeah. street. Uh, Adrian, I ask you to wrap it up. The I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> Where else, where else do we have long uninterrupted buildings? And I, one of the answers is at, at Liquor Mart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, that dead wall. Um, not that I don't have deep affection for it, but. Yeah. <laughs> of course, we all do. Um, any other comments around key issue number two? Okay. Then um, key issue number three is around the parking reduction. Um, let's do a. Uh, negative poll as to, let me just pull up the, the language of the key issue first. Um, does the 31% vehicular parking reduction meet the criteria of 9214H2L, which is criteria for parking reduction? Um, is there anybody who believes that it does not? 
Does anybody want to speak to this matter? Sarah. So uh, I'm not, uh, I'm really interested in the alternative fund and I'm concerned uh, without knowing what the uh, economic assumptions were that went into $50 per unit um, to uh, there is not a unit in this building that couldn't house two people because if this, as I understand it, the smallest efficiency is something like 260 square feet and under our current code, two people can be in a, a efficiency of that size. Um, so uh, we, uh, there could be a lot of people living in this building um, and I just don't know that um, uh, $50 per unit accumulates enough for to serve the needs of what what the applicant hopes will be many, many, many residents who will not have cars. Um, and I would like to know a little bit more about the calculations that led to $50 per unit and uh, whether uh, that can be reconsidered um, what the implications of that might be. Maybe that's a question to Sloan. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sloan, are you comfortable taking that? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is I don't know the specifics of how um, they came to that number, but I do know that there was a lot of conversations with the Boulder and other departments in the city about what would be appropriate, and they did feel like this was appropriate as part of the TDM. But the applicant may have a more detailed explanation. Well, so one, I would like, I, I'd like, I'd like to, for us to be thinking about whether there's some sort of condition we could consider that would allow for some flexibility in the alternative fund plan uh, that could lead to more m being a, a per resident versus per unit if from a from a, if the if it turns out that that's what's really needed to make this uh, a u usable and useful fund for the minimum 147 people maximum 600 people who might live in this um, development. I mean, I, I guess what I would say is you are able to condition it if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, I just, I just, I know that everyone else will have comments, but I'm just, it's, I just want to make sure that it can be as flexible as possible given what the population of the building might ultimately be. John? Yeah, I... I think Sarah's idea makes a lot of sense. I'm just trying to figure out how we might mm -hmm. put that into a condition that that is flexible enough to to accomplish what what we're trying to do here. Um, is there some way to have a staff review of the of the arrangements and uh, give them give them the authority to change that number if they feel it's appropriate? Maybe that's a question for Hella, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm gonna to have to think about that a little bit, <clears throat> how that could be structured. So give me a little bit of time, maybe you guys move on to your next issues if there's any left and come back to me. So this is our last issue. Um, so Hella, you're going to have to think fast or. or <laughs> uh, I can uh, distract us with one little item if you'd like me to. Um, yeah, David. Well, with the, um, and, and um, <clears throat> Lisa spoke to the sump principles earlier. Um, and uh, uh, I think that um, it's great to see the uh, uh, parking spaces being charged separately from the uh, rental. Uh, and um, I guess, and this is just, this isn't probably a criteria or anything like that, but I would encourage 
uh, them to set the prices pretty high. I mean, uh, real estate for parking is, gosh, what's the difference between that and the square footage in your apartment? So, um, so I, I think that if you make it pretty expensive to buy those parking spaces, kind of keeping, of course, in mind what the market will bear, um, it can it can help uh, maybe offset the, the the rents a little bit. So lower the rent a few dollars and up the cost of the parking a few dollars. That would be my suggestion, uh, but obviously not a criteria based thing. And the other thing I wanted to uh, just mention is a, lot, a few people brought up the question of the EcoPass three year thing. I've noticed that that's kind of like a city template. And, uh, you know, and I think I've asked Charles this in the past that the city doesn't necessarily want to be um, putting things like that in perpetuity. So it's just sort of a, a thing that was or a, a sort of the standard thing. You get the, um, the EcoPass thing to be for the next three years under the assumption that it will be renewed. Uh, so um, I think that that makes, it, it makes sense. I guess, I guess at some point um, it would be kind of like a non-site specific question we might want to ask maybe in a retreat. Is that working? Should those be longer? Uh, do they get re-upped and do we have any, uh, any levers to pull in terms of renewing those things beyond the three years? But I, I think that that's generally what we see in there. So I, I was happy to see that. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. And um, Sloan and Hella and myself are chatting here behind the scenes, but I'm just wondering if Chris McGranahan um, with LSC, the transportation consultant, had any thoughts on um, the concept that Sarah and John have brought forward? This is Chris. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. This is Chris McGranahan, LSC transportation consultants. Uh, we did do the TDM plan. Um, whenever we first got involved with the project, we knew there was going to be a parking reduction and it quickly became obvious it was going to be a little over 20%. So I'll say a few things. One, you know, the 31% is the request for the residential units. Uh, it actually drops down to something like 12% if you were to factor in the moped motorcycle spaces, but you know, we don't get to count those. So we felt like there was this little bit of a shortfall with just providing the eco passes and the you know the surveys and all the things that we have in cage it downtown to help with alternative travel modes we felt like we needed something else to just make that parking reduction make sense and so by working with staff david thompson specifically but others uh, we felt that an additional uh, alternative transportation fund of 50 dollars per unit would be a good idea we kind of bounced around you know some different amounts but 50 seemed to be the, uh, the number that we fell on. And the way that the condition is written is that there has to be a management plan submitted at some point in the near future. And that management plan we thought would include the language about how that could be sunsetted in the future if supported by data and agreed to by staff. So that management plan, I think would where we would, we would uh, focus on the long, whether it goes away or not in the future, that's totally up to staff, but you know, we would be able to influence that if we have data to support it. I'm not sure if the, you know, if $50 basically felt like a good number, staff felt it was good, we felt it was good. So uh, our client was comfortable with it. So that's why we proposed it was, we felt like we were a little bit short with just the typical TDM measures. And we felt like that was the little extra thing we needed to, to support that parking reduction. So hopefully that gives us a little bit more clarity. Yeah. That that helps us and it actually kind of jogs my memory. Um, but I would remind the board that the condition of approval does give the um, review authority to the city manager. So at the end of the day, the city does have authority there. Can I just respond to what Chris told us? So yeah. it sounded like the condition uh, uh, says uh, that uh, this can be sunsetted at some point. Could the condition add a phrase that said, or expanded? Um, so that uh, depending on what the data shows, uh, it could go either in either direction, um, either smaller or larger as a program for the residents. Would that create the opening for further discussion as data comes in? Sarah, I'm going I'm to read the condition. Okay, thank and you. So the condition says the applicant shall establish an alternative transportation fund, which every year, shall, so that's to eternity, 
shall provide funds of no less than $50 per dwelling unit for the 147 dwelling units in the new building to support transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle. Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the new building, the applicant should, shall submit a plan for the management of the fund subject to review and approval of the city manager. So the way it's written, it's required that this supplement all the other uh, TDMs that they're doing, the three years of the eco pass, the additional uh, bike parking, motorcycle and scooter parking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've, they've got to be doing the 50 times 147 every year in, until the, the building comes down uh, mm -hmm. some, sometime in 100 or 200 years or whatever we hope. <laughs> um, and, and what I, you know, I, the applicant mentioned that it could sunset if it was deemed to be unnecessary, um, but that's the, the default position is that it never sunsets. Okay, thank you for that legal reading. John? Yeah, I, uh, I was also paying close attention to Chris McGranahan's comments. And to be honest, it sounds very much to me like that $50 is not very well supported or there's not based on anything more than, a, than it being a round number. Uh, so that's why I personally am interested in having staff review that and have the ability to change it either more or less as, as they see fit. Uh, and, and so it's very similar to Sarah's comments, I think. So John, the, the language is, shall provide funds of no less than $50. So it can be more for the terms of the condition. Right. But how would it, you know, would it, would it be a, a staff decision if they decide it needs to be 75 or 100 or 500 yeah. for that matter? Or how does it change? Subject to review, and I, I, I think I might write the, the condition a little bit differently um, because the second sentence says that the applicant shall submit a plan for the management of the funds subject to review and approval of the city manager. So the, the only thing that's subject to review and approval is the management of the fund. The fund is set at no less than $50. So I think, you know, I might, you know, suggest a couple of changes that the $50 be um, increased based on cost of living annually and, and that the, the city manager also has the authority to, uh, to, to review the, um, the, the use of the fund and not just the management. But that's as far as I think I would be comfortable going. Lupita? Yeah, I was thinking along those lines, I think having the, because I like, I like the minimum amount, the fact that it's set with the possibility of increasing. There's another portion that I was thinking that maybe it's just including the language that any unused funds from one year can be rolled over to future, in which case it can accrue if, if things are working on and it seems like that is an increasing uh, budget, uh, it will be, a, they, those who do, um, do need the money, you know, probably will get more benefits. Um, but that's, that's about it. I think that they have done a good job to account for that. And I really like uh, Sarah's idea of, you know, just kind of keeping track of this particular issue. John? Yeah, I, I'm still puzzled by what your your willingness to have a minimum, but but not a, a maximum or a an, a an arrangement in which that amount can be changed. So what is it that I'm not understanding about your your thoughts there? My thoughts, John? Yes. Oh, no, I was just responding that um, that it says no less than 50. So it can be more. Right. But how, how would that number be changed? Would it be the city manager who would make that decision? You know, of no, course, it's staff. Uh, input or? Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm just trying to understand how that number might change from the minimum. Yeah, that was where I was suggesting that the, um, the, 
the amount be subject to review and approval of the city manager, not just the plan for the management of the money that's in the fund. Um, you know, I, I don't, it gets us into a, a sort of a legally murky area. If, if you say, you know, you're being approved for a project that might cost you $50 a unit or it might cost a lot more and, and nobody knows. It's kind of written that way right now though, when it says no less than 50 instead of 50 and no more, um, you know, the condition's already written in a way that doesn't have a cap. So yeah, I don't know, I, I, I think I'd, I might wanna tweak the condition a little in a few areas. So one of the things that I would be concerned about is what, what would the standard be and what triggers um, the applicant having to come back in. We don't have a process like that in place right now where there's a, a check-in that comes back. Um, when, when do you all think there should be a review? What should trigger a check-in? Well, I suppose, I mean, the reason I brought this up originally just as a, as an idea, a thought was, um, since it's not entirely clear how these funds would be dispersed or used, um, uh, but that they are, it's, uh, accounted for by unit rather than by the number of people living in the building. It just struck me that there might be a disconnect between the amounts of funds gathered and the need to utilize those funds. Um, and if there is, if it turns out that there is a disconnect, that disconnect actually exists, how do we, how can the applicant uh, address that in the future? That's, and that's sort of what I'm trying to understand. Um, because it does strike me that um, while the 31% reduction in parking meets the, the, the code, um, this, is a very, this could be a very, very heavily populated building. Um, and while it is downtown and while it may mean that people can walk to work or to school or and walk to all their shopping, we also know because we all live here that lots of people have a car to go up into the mountains <laughs> on the weekends. And um, uh, just because there's four people living in one of the four bedroom apartments doesn't mean there won't be four cars for those four people um, or four, four people who want to utilize this fund on a regular basis. So I'm just, I'm just trying to, to imagine moving forward how, how that disconnect, if it does in fact appear, can be remedied over time. So the yeah, the applicant always has the, the option to come back in and seek an amendment from what you required. Mm -hmm. it, I, I'm, that's how it always works, I guess. Mm -hmm. So they find that Nobody is using the funds as they're approved to be used. They could come in and propose something else, or if they're finding that nobody's using a period, maybe it could be eliminated. Um, I think that's. But that's, what's the what is the what's the pressure if more people want to use the fund than they have collected for, and. Um, What's, what, tr what would trigger that? Um, I think there could be a requirement in there that the funds be increased if it, it can't keep up with the demand that it's being created. Okay. Um, something I was just gonna add is that, <clears throat> and it would depend on a lot of things like how easy it was to rent a unit out and how much people wanted to live there or if we all, you know, start creating mini farms somewhere. Um, <laughs> small fantasy I've been having recently that probably isn't practical. Um, but um, 
there, there may be some market forces coming into play there too. If you have a bunch of unhappy tenants who are trying to use more spots than you can provide to them, you can use market forces, assuming there's demand for the units, uh, to incentivize people not to park on site, um, you know, and or to have fewer vehicles. Uh, and, and you could do things like paying into a fund to give them access to a discounted cost for ride share, um, you know, or um, free access to e-bikes, you know, or something like that. So, so I kind of agree with the responsibility and the drive to get this right now as planning board and, you know, for the city to incentivize it correctly. And at the same time, I have a degree of trepidation about constraining it too specifically. Um, I like the idea of making sure that they can raise it. I like setting some expectations around what that means for TDM and how it impacts traffic downtown, how it impacts neighbors, how it benefits residents. Um, but I, I don't think we're going to know the answer and I'm not sure they're going to know the answer until they start offering stuff to their residents and seeing what people, you know, choose to do and, and what's, you know, what actually makes a difference. Um, you know, so I guess that would be one of the things I would say is, you know, let, let's try not to constrain them too much while also providing incentives to, um, you know, kind of respect Cajun, respect downtown, take advantage of all that. And some of it might be like satellite parking at some offsite location or something, you know, you only use your car on the weekends, great, here's somewhere you can park your car, you know. Um, but, but again, I would kind of leave that up to the management staff to try to figure out how they're going to navigate that while setting some expectations around what that needs to look like and how it's not spilling over into other areas. The nice thing is we do have um, MPPs and other stuff surrounding that location, so the spillover is relatively contained in the near area just because of where it is. Um, I'm not, I don't see a whole lot of like street parking happening, for example. So I'm going I'm to jump in and say that um, I think this is a case where if if the applicant hadn't offered this, we wouldn't be asking for it. Um, you know, that the applicant has provided, I don't even know how they came up with the number of bicycle parking spaces, but it's, it's huge. Um, Sloan, did you need to interrupt? Or did you just want to talk? Uh, well, I, if, if you want some background on the $50, I found some of our review comments that give a clue to why it's $50 if you're sure. interested. Go for it. Okay, so in our initial review comments on the site review, this is from transportation staff. It says, staff agrees this site can accommodate a parking reduction given the TDM strategy to provide eco passes to residents in close proximity to the site to the Boulder Transit Center. Staff also appreciates the alternative transportation subsidy fund being proposed for the residents of the site, but the alternative transportation subsidy fund doesn't provide a long-term TDM strategy for residents who don't own cars. Additional TDM strategies the applicant might consider in requesting a parking reduction is paying the membership fees for residents to join both a car share and bike share program, providing residents with an annual $25 credit each year to be used for either a car share or bike share services. So I think that $25 was multiplied by an average of two residents to get that $50 to cover a bike share and or car share membership. But since that time, they've also expanded it to be used by other things like Lyft or um, to be more flexible, essentially. Okay, thank you. So I think in, in reality, the way that this, this fund is gonna work is um, you know, the first year before there's full occupancy, because the way the condition is written, it's going to have to be paid because it's payable every year. Um, it's going to get paid by the developer um, and, and it's going to start to charge up the fund. And then as people begin to occupy, I would think that it's, it's more likely than not that, uh, that this will be kind of tacked on to your rent. And so I'm not comfortable with the notion of uh, doing it by person instead of by unit, uh, because I think it's, it's, um, it becomes too invasive, you know, uh, I've got a 15 year old kid and a wife, and there are three of us living in an apartment. So 
do they charge for three of us? But the boy's not old enough to drive yet. And when he turns 16 or 17 and he gets a car now, you know, do I have to pay three times 50? Um, you know, it, it could be a discrimination on the basis of family size, which is problematic. Um, and so I, I, I think doing it by unit probably makes the most sense. Um, I, I would rather see if we're talking about something that's meant to live in perpetuity and be available to the HOA to distribute to the residents who need additional assistance. I, I'd just rather see if we're gonna make any change that the $50 per dwelling unit number is required to be recalibrated for cost of living on a every four year basis or something that's not onerous. Because imagine yourself on an HOA and you know that every single year you've got to figure out that now it's $51.12 and next year it's $52.03. Um, you know, so things like uh, studies of deferred maintenance are required uh, for HOAs every three or four years. Uh, I'd rather just ask that the number be recalibrated every three or four years, but um, for as, as many issues as I might have with the way that the condition is worded, um, I think I trust that the transportation engineer and staff came up with a reasonable number, and, and I would only recommend if we're going to tweak it at all, just knowing that it's a long-lived building, we expect it to be around for decades, um, that we not leave this $50 number alone because in 2078, 50 bucks per person is, per dwelling is gonna be nothing. Um, so maybe it just needs to scale up. Can I, um, is there, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the idea of, um, of, of having it be maybe different based on how many people would live in a place or whatever. Um, is there anything about the condition that precludes uh, the actual uh, pricing to use something like maybe um, higher square footage units paid more and lower square footage units pay less, which takes the person out of it? Uh, but um, is there, a, it says 50 per unit, but does that mean that it has to be $50 exactly per unit, or if, if it is implemented with a, a scaling based on unit size or something, is that something that could be done? I just wasn't sure if, if the $50 was just a hard and fast tied to every single physical unit. Yeah, I think the way that the current condition is written, it is. But I think to Sloan's point, I think the rationale was, um, you know, you have, say, two people in a unit, the average is 50 bucks. I think that was the the rationale that was applied. Any more thoughts? John? So I, I would support uh, Sarah's original proposal, which if I understood correctly was just that that number may need to change and it should be the city, someone in the city who uh, is involved in making that determination. If I understood Sarah's comments correctly, maybe I, I didn't. I, certainly the first half, which is that the number should be able to change and maybe the, the splitting the baby way to do that is to have a COLA increase uh, set for every few years. Because um, it does sound, I mean, I don't remember exactly what um, Harmon read, but there is a a back and forth between the manager of the building and the city manager. So, you know, I, I have no idea if such a fund exists in any other rental building in the city. So I don't know if this is something that the city staff will uh, have to learn about through doing or whether we have um, experience with this model before, from before. Charles, what do you know? Um, I don't, but I'm looking right now. <laughs> okay. Because if it, if it is a first, if it hasn't been done before, then there's some real value in, in uh, thinking of it as a pilot and what can we learn from it. I want to um, say that we do. It has been, it has been done before, um, not very often. But I, just... I, I, I believe it was done in, for 1440 Pine, the transitional housing. 
I think we had a condition there, and then I, I believe there maybe have been one other project that I can uh, think Yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I feel like we've done it before. Uh, yeah, so 1440 actually only has a few parking spots for residents, um, and all the rest are rented out. Um, so I don't know if that still fits with exactly this same idea. And I think it's a really interesting, I'm not, I don't mean to be criticizing the idea. I just want to do what we can not today so that it can be uh, the most effective tool to augment the, the other elements of the TDM. And if may, you know, maybe we just start with the COLA increase over every X number of years, and then five, 10 years from now, the next planning board can re revisit. I would just say with regards to an annual increase, we wouldn't have a mechanism to um, track that. So the only way we would find out about it is through sort of an enforcement means. Uh, so it wouldn't be annual. I think Harmon's idea of, you know, every four or five years recalculate to COLA. Um, and I guess we'd have to do it on trust with the property manager. Um, Can it, I mean, to the enforcement point is an excellent point. Is it possible, and maybe this doesn't meet our needs, but is it possible to write it where again, you kind of give the permission and encourage that that be done and it's more a matter of a tool in their possession to continue to meet the TDM, which is part of the requirements that they possess. You know, so instead of it being something where staff has to cover it again or see whether it's being enforced, it's written more as, you know, property manager is encouraged to increase fund over time in concert with COLA to continue to meet TDM requirements as outlined at you know, the time that the development was approved. There could also be, you could create a reporting requirement that the, the project has to report to the city on a regular basis what they put into the fund. That, I, I, I think that's a, a good idea. I, I had, I'm, I'm sure that the applicant is pulling his hair out, <laughs> but I, I do think that that's actually a good idea in part because it creates a partnership between the property manager and the city in um, evaluating this particular model. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a, a good, a good idea that the, the two are partnered. Hella, are you thinking about what, what kind of language would be required in the condition to make it a reporting requirement? Yeah, I think you would want to think about how frequently and, and what are you reporting on if, if you want to have an increase. Um, I, I guess it would be probably based on that. Well, the, the, the applicant already imagines evaluating whether the project is work is serving its purpose or not because written into the condition is that it might sun or written into at least the assumption of the condition is that it might sunset and they would only do that if they have data. I, well, it would be, there'd have to be data to determine whether it sunsets or not. So maybe just expanding on the, on the sharing of that data with the city. I'm not sure I understand where you're going with that. Well, just you said um, uh, that there'd have to be, I, now I'm blanking on the language that you used, but that um, there'd have to be a mechanism for evaluating whether the project was working. Um, and, uh, bef bef and I, I mean, this, the applicant has to have this, has to have its own mechanism for evaluating whether to continue the program or not. 
Yeah, I think if to eliminate the program, they would have to come in and and seek an amendment. And at that point in time, um, it would then be, I guess, the parking reduction, because this was part of it, would be reevaluated. So, yeah. so I think that's already taken care of through okay. the code requirements. It's so maybe the solution here is just to focus on um, a COLA increase every X number of years, whatever would be appropriate, um, three years, four years, I'm not really sure. Um, and, uh, and then the rest of it, the rest of the fun, the, re the remainder of the, the condition is as written that it's in perpetuity and there's some engagement with the city manager. Sarah, are you suggesting that there be some engagement with the city manager around the amount of money required to be put into the plan? No, I, I think, not, I guess if we're going to focus on, I think uh, what I'm being convinced of here is that there's no easy way to, there's no easy mechanism to answer that question going forward. And so if, uh, if, uh, in, unless, there's no easy way to answer that question. The COLA increase work, uh, sort of forces a bit of an increase over time. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, uh, unless we're gonna give this, unless the condition somehow gives the city manager the, power to require a, an, an increase above and beyond a, a COLA, uh, I don't think, it, does, it just doesn't sound to me based on what Charles and Hella are saying that there's really a mechanism to address that particular component. So I, I'm, I'm okay sticking with just a COLA increase that's recalculated every X number of years. What do people think of Lupita's idea of unspent funds having to remain in the fund? Sort of I think it's oh, yeah, sort of for the, the use on the for for the purposes that were specified. Sloan? Um, no. That's how these funds work. So whatever is not used would remain in the funds. They wouldn't be able to withdraw them. So it doesn't even need to be said in the condition. Not as far as I understand it, no. That would be in the management plan that they submit to the city for approval. You agree That's with something that? we would expect to be in there. Okay, let, let me just ask, Kelly, do you agree with that assessment that a yes. sentence like any unspent funds must remain in the alternative transportation fund um, until exhausted for the purposes uh, that the fund is designed for is unnecessary? Yes, unless, yeah, and, and that could then be changed through an amendment or minor modification process, right? If, if you find out that you're just accumulating more and more and they're not being used, then the applicant would come back in and, and could ask for those to be released, I guess, but that would be the only mechanism. Okay, then, then let's not, good idea, Lupita, but not necessary to write it in. Thank you. Okay, so um, I've got some language uh, that I can send to Cindy if you want to put it up. Uh, and then maybe we'll have a motion. I will put it up once I see it. Yeah, I got to get it to you first. Yeah, no problem. Okay. 
Should be, should be on the way. Okay. We're waiting with bated breath. There it is. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So you can just highlight the middle sentence of the three because I didn't touch the other two. Starting with the dollar amount? Yeah, and ending in year. That can just highlight. Okay. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Everyone can see it, right? Yep. Okay. Probably capitalized Department of Labor Bureau, but that's just minor. Yeah, I mean, this is actually lifted directly out of state statute. I just oh, interesting. from the, the state of Colorado. So you can take that up with the, uh, the office of- failure to edit. You, you can call the Office of Legislative Legal Services in Denver and see what they think about it. <laughs> Redline their, their records for them. I, I'm, I'm good with it. I mean, it doesn't, it, I, I'm totally great with this. There, I think there's, it's a more challenging set of issues that we were trying to get at and we just don't have a tool to get at it. So I think this is a good, a good step. And you could add a requirement that it, that there be a report at that point that's submitted to the city. Um, Actually, so can I try to stay away from that um, because we don't know what needs to be in the report and it starts getting into what are the criteria for approval of the report. And I think we're at the point now where um, at least the, the person who's the, the driver of this language, Sarah, is saying this is enough. So, um, you know, unless people are really interested in forcing the applicant into a reporting requirement that, that we don't really have a, a set of criteria for, um, I'm happy with the motion the way it's written. Any it, thoughts? It could be just a report to report, you know, about what it was increased to. Okay, that that's reasonable. Well, could, could I just make a point? It does actually reference in here uh, that the applicant shall submit a plan for the management of the fund. Um, that plan uh, could be part of, you know, like could be resubmitted every four years at the cost adjustment point with that actually no revisions, but that would give them the applicant or the manager the option to revise the plan in conjunction with the cost of living uh, uh, increase, which has been well described here. So it, maybe there just could be some language about and reissuing or and re, re, resending the plan if any changes are in order or something like that. So uh, you as an option, you know, just resend the plan if the if there are adjustments to the plan over, you know. I think that's a good idea. So what if we added language like prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the new building and upon uh, every quadrennial uh, uh, um, every, qu every COLA readjustment? Well, we have not a COLA, so um, okay. So just, just every quadrennial yeah. readjustment because yeah. it says or every quadrennial adjustment, which I think will make it, it's pretty clear that it's referring to what you just saw in the sentence before. 
You can even add the word quadrennial before the first adjusted, quadrennially adjusted. <laughs> and then it will be obvious that it correlates, but yeah. I think this is great. And that way, if they don't change the plan, it's just a matter of resending the same plan that was there before. So it doesn't add a whole process. But it does leave open the opportunity for the city manager to review um, if, you know, transportation needs or options change dramatically, just in general, not necessarily specific to that building, but I'm, I'm, I like these changes. Um, uh, we have language here saying that it's the applicant, but what if he sells it to somebody else? Uh, don't we mean to say the owner or operator or manager or something of the sort like that? The, the requirements run with the land. They, they become part of a development agreement that's recorded against the land. So future owners would be subject to them the same way. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. So thank you all. This was awesome. Does this pass muster, Hella? My thought is that whatever whatever nexus was demonstrated to to give staff the authority um, to ask the applicant for fifty dollars per dwelling unit to supplement the TDM, um, you know that nexus is is furthered by um, that quadrennial adjustment based on the consumer price index. So I don't think we're going beyond what what we're entitled to condition so um, that's, that's all you're going to add on the, yeah. the adjustment yes that's fine okay yay okay so um are there any let's go back to the matter at hand um we kind of presaged our motion language um already looks like we've got a pretty strong majority of board members who are in favor of voting for approval of this application uh, as as uh, adjusted by this one condition that we amended a bit. Um, so is, is there any further discussion or do people want to um, maybe make a motion at this point? If I don't, I can't. I'll make, I'll make a motion. Okay, so, uh, go ahead, Sarah. So now what do I have to tell me what I'm reading here? Because I don't have it in front of me. Look on. Uh, is this it? The motion ought to be towards the front of the staff report. And then you'll you'll say with the addition of uh, the amended language to condition. All right, hold on. It's all, it's all, I think it's all displayed there with the with the just um, the in addition between oh, the two. Just help you out. Okay, so I'm uh, making a, the, right here, what's in front of me right here? Yep, yep. Uh, making a motion to approve a site review case number LUR 2019. Whoops, it just, I just lost it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. That's it's okay. my fault. My I didn't realize you were reading my screen. I am, uh, I was reading your screen. Is that a problem? No, 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 I'm, I'm going back, going back for you. Sorry about that. Here we are. Now John I hasn't seconded it yet, so don't read that part. I won't. Okay. Uh, to approve site review, case number LUR 2019-00058, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum. Uh, the applicant shall establish an alternative transportation fund, which every year shall provide funds of no less than $50 per dwelling unit for the 147 dwelling units in the new building to support transportation alternatives to the single occupancy vehicle. The dollar amount set forth in the foregoing sentence shall be adjusted on the first day of every fourth year in accordance with any increase in the United States Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics 
final consumer price index for the Denver Boulder Consolidated Metropolitan Statistical Area for the preceding calendar year. Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the new building and upon every quadrennial adjustment, the applicants shall submit a plan for the management of the fund subject to review and approval by the, uh, of the city manager. Okay. Anybody want to make a second? John Gerstel. Oh, sorry. So I saw John's hand first, sorry, um, and that'll save Cindy the trouble of changing his name. <laughs> drafted minutes Thanks. so uh is there any discussion to the motion and i would suggest that you make clear that um the second paragraph that's shown right now um repla yeah replaces condition eight in the staff memorandum yeah so i was gonna do that when i restated the motion hella I, would that be enough Yeah. Okay. Any any thoughts? All right. Then uh, I'd like to make that a motion to the board. Uh, motion by Silver, seconded by Gerstel. Um, we move to approve site review case number LUR 2019-0058, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact, and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum with the following language to replace condition number eight. And I won't read all of that language again because it's already been spoken and written. Uh, take a roll call vote now. If I may interrupt. Yeah. Um, before you vote on this, and I can't, it's so small on my screen, I can't read it, um, but I think it would be good to add a standard for the review by the city something like I think relating it back to the parking reduction criteria um, to ensure that the parking to ensure the efficiency of the plan so that the parking demands of the project can be met does that make sense yeah so so I, I would suggest um that we use the language that's already in the first sentence instead um just to support transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle um so maybe something like uh to ensure that the fund is still adequate to support transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle i'm sorry where does that fit in let's let's make sure everybody likes it before you write it down. Does that make sense to people? That makes sense to Hella. It does. Okay, so then, then I would say, um, and upon every quadrennial adjustment to confirm that, or ensure that, I don't know which, which one, how strong we wanna get, um, any thoughts? Confirm or ensure? Are we just checking or are we forcing? <laughs> That's what those two words mean. Ensure. I'm a. I would say ensure. Okay. So, if everybody agrees, John, to ensure that the fund, capital F, uh, continues to support, and then you can. Just copy and paste transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle on the third line at the beginning. Oh, thank you. I'm looking. Oh. Right. Yep. There you go. Nope. I'm very impressed with all that labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics language. <laughs> um, somebody really had that in their back pocket. <laughs> I just knew where to find it in the state law. Okay, so 
now I will read it again because we've messed with it so much. So, um, and, and maybe um, ask if Sarah accepts. Oh yeah. And if anybody yes. has a direction to it. Sarah accepts. Okay. And as we learned in our retreat, John, you don't need to. If oh, friendly John. is only, you, the only thing you can do is withdraw. So would you with, would, do you want to keep being the seconder or do you want to withdraw? No, I'm uh, honored to keep being. Okay. So now I'm going to read this and we'll see if it reads like anything. Um, so the, the planning board's motion by Silver, seconded by Gerstel, is to approve site review case number LUR 2019-0058, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum with the following language to replace condition number eight. The applicant shall establish an alternative transportation fund, which every year shall provide funds of no less than $50 per dwelling unit for the 147 dwelling units in the new building to support transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle. The dollar amount set forth in the foregoing sentence shall be adjusted on the first day of every fourth year in accordance with any increase in the United States Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics final consumer price index for the Denver Boulder Consolidated Metropolitan Statistical Area for the preceding calendar year. Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the new building and upon every quadrennial adjustment to ensure that the fund continues to support transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle, the applicant shall submit a plan for the management of the fund subject to review and approval of the city manager. Do we need to specify who the submission goes to? No, because the city manager is just shorthand for the planning department. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now um, any, any uh, additional comments around this motion as, as amended? Okay, then I'm gonna call a roll call vote. Uh, David Ensign? Aye. John Gerstel? Aye. Sarah Silver? Aye. Lupita Montoya? Aye. Lisa Smith? Aye. Peter Vitale? Aye. And Harmon Zuckerman votes aye. So the motion passes and the site review is approved seven nothing. Congratulations. Yay. Okay, do people need another break before we uh, we go on to the last item? Adrian, did you need to say something? I said thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> well, the last item is just matters, right? Well, I think there's still a presentation. No, no, it's, it's just a strictly information uh, item on East Boulder, which I can just kind of summarize in a minute. Okay, then let's not take a break. <laughs> so uh, as we've indicated, the East Boulder subcommunity plan project has been impacted by um, staffing reductions um, as well as budget reduction. So we had about $155,000 budget for consultant services to advance the, the work of the East Boulder subcommunity plan. So since that time, we've had to neck back um, staffing and comprehensive planning and the $155,000 consultant budget has gone away. So um, we're able to continue on with the commitments that were made um, for the project, but we'll have to do a lot more of it in-house and use some different tools, um, which is going to result in the schedule pushing out from 18 months to now 24 to 28 months. Um, so an estimated completion in September 2021. So that's really the essence of the update. If there's any um, questions or concerns, you can feel free to send them directly to Kathleen King. Her um, information is, is in the memo. So it's basically extending the schedule six to 10 months so that um, we can do more of the work in-house and use some different tools. Okay. Questions, comments, John? 
Yeah, as, as the uh, planning board liaison to, to this effort, I can say that they're doing tremendous work. And yeah. uh, the work I, the I'm in well. admiration. Thanks very much, John. I'll pass that along. It's great to hear. Thanks, John. We'll just keep you longer as a working group member. <laughs> <laughs> More four hour meetings for you, John. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to do with myself anymore. <laughs> So that's it from staff. Uh, I, have, I have something. Um, I'd just like to take an informal poll with you since I have a captive audience real quick. Um, um, Sloan's memo was um, the new template, which we'd like to kind of try and roll out for you guys. Right. I um, want to mention that and, and thank staff for that too. So go ahead, Cindy. Oh, well, it, it mirrors um, the city council memos. And um, so I might be, ch and I, I do both now. I submit the memos to council now. And so I'm gonna be, you might see some changes coming up with like bookmarks and headers and footers and things like that. Like I, one thing I thought of that I wanted to ask you since I have you, um, you'll note in your planning board memos, I create links to all the attachments within the memos. How do you feel if that went away? If I didn't do that anymore, would that be? I like them. <laughs> I like them. Please keep, please keep them. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. They're really valuable because yeah. um, there's so much, so many frameworks we have to operate within, and it's very helpful to have them all in one place. Okay. Train an unpaid intern to go through and do them for you and get credit for their program. It doesn't take me very long. It's just the council doesn't do that. And so I just was curious if you guys, how much you really rely on it. So I was just That's, curious. Yeah, thanks for raising that, Cindy, because it completely slipped my mind. But if the board, um, you know, liked this format, then we'll continue on with it. There's no objections. Maybe city council would like to have all those links they don't actually. Really? No, they, they don't. don't want to read all that background material. <laughs> no. Those thousand no. page packets. <laughs> They're minimalists. <laughs> well, so the answer is um, this was really seamless. Um, you know, th this was a total revamping of the staff report template. And all it did was make everything shorter, more well-organized and easier to understand and less repetitive. So um, great job, you guys. That, uh, that's not so easy to do. You know, I've, I can say, I don't, I don't usually um, tell anecdotes, but I've done that in my life as a, you know, when I had your job, Charles, and um, it's hard taking a template that all your planners are used to using for years and years and years and suddenly saying, no, it's gotta look like this. So well done. Yeah, and actually I would credit Sloan with that because I think she's the one who actually um, kind of retooled it and brought it forward. So, um, you know, um, the answer always lies within staff. You should have seen the meeting when we were trying to roll it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I withdraw my compliments for you, Charles. And I just oh, no, you know, the answers always lie within the team. Um, I usually just get in the way. So uh, I would definitely credit Sloan and the rest of the team for kind of having the difficult discussion and tearing it all apart. So okay, um, well. I'm glad that it's worked. Great, great job. Yeah, team. Chairman, did you want to touch on call ups as well? Because I know that we had a brief discussion at um, our agenda meeting on Tuesday. Yeah. So what I was hoping is that, that you might maybe with Hella's help talk about um, how how call-ups work and what the legal requirements are and then uh, how to kind of institute some best practices on planning board for doing call-ups. Yeah, I, I can just short circuit it. It's just really helpful for staff and the applicant um, when something is called up to maybe, you know, either publicly or, you know, if there's just an email um, behind the scenes that helps explain the rationale for the call-up. It just helps us um, be able to prepare the memo and the presentation. Um, and then it's also helpful for the applicant and, and in their preparation for the meeting. So what Charles is saying is, is um, it only takes one person to call up 
a, uh, a call up item. And, and as a courtesy to staff and also to the applicant, if you, if you want to call something up, give the rationale as to why. Um, it, it just makes everything work better. It's a big help. Okay. Um, anything else from the planning director? Cindy. Uh, just a reminder that I did send out an email to you all, this is kind of under calendar check, that um, August 20th is our next meeting and it will be starting an hour early at 5 p.m. And we'll be kicking off with the CIP that night. We just have a, um, a pretty detailed agenda uh, that night. We're going to be talking about code changes, so um, I, I don't want you guys doing that at 11 o'clock. Okay. Hey. What are you talking about? Coaching? Code changes. Oh, Here's code changes. I'm sorry. I thought you said coaching. And I <laughs> <laughs> you take away community benefits, the most exciting thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to see if we could go ahead and get through the CIP um, earlier in the evening. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Anything else? Um, uh, uh, so the next. Um, landmarks meeting is i don't have it quite pulled up but i wanted to see lupita if you wanted to be the person who goes to that one i went to the last one we had talked about switching on and off you're muted i think i am mm -hmm. um so i have noise my son just came home and i have to feed the second one i mean I, i've been taken off and you know i don't know if you noticed i just dash out because i have to take care of boys um so the date for the next meeting is it uh, next week august 12th mm -hmm. uh i think so yeah okay great so uh, you'll go to the august 12th meeting lupita yes okay great make sure that i get that info yeah um i don't know what the best way to do that um I, i'm not, are you already getting all the emails related to that lupita yes i just need to be another reminder so i'll make sure i'll put it in my claire, claire should be on that yeah good. yeah yeah all right good to see you guys corroborating on landmarks um any uh city attorney comments and matters Hello, all from from you, Hella. Is there anything from the city attorney? Sounds like there isn't. Thing from the city attorney. Yeah. <laughs> Just check it. Yeah. Uh, so we're done. If unless there are more matters from the planning board or anybody wants to debrief. Um, I was just going to say one thing, and that is that um, Jane Brodigan has announced her retirement, which you probably all saw. Um, she'll be leaving in October. I don't remember the exact day. And I don't know how much folks have worked directly with her as city manager. Um, but I just, I thought it was worth mentioning that and hopefully we'll have chances to acknowledge it later. She's, I think, the longest or one of the longest serving city managers in the history of Boulder and uh, the first woman to hold the position. So, 12 years, I think. 12, 12 years. years. Yeah, bravo, Jane. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Great work. Well, as, as always, I'd like to thank Jean um, for a smooth meeting. And of course, Cindy, I'd also like to wish Cindy a happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Coming up on Saturday. Yes, thank you. We didn't embarrassingly we didn't say to you. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a boring one this year. <laughs> All right. Sure thing. Just don't have the cops call to your house again. Lonnie and I are going to lay by the pool. <laughs> Six feet apart. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, um, do we have an extension? I, I assume that we're going to continue to meet remotely, or are we still waiting for formal guidance from council? Council will have that discussion on August 4th, so next Tuesday night, um, about um, what a return to in-person board and commission meetings would look like. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I so have a we'll question. Yeah, and I have a question, John. Um, for our CU South uh, work, um, I, I, we had tentative dates, but I haven't. I think they withdrew all those dates, right? So yeah, we're, we're waiting. We, for we got, uh, uh, Joanne. Uh, uh, I forgot her last name. Hello. Joanna. 
Blue. sent out an email in, to you also with a new schedule. Oh, okay. Uh, so there is a new schedule. So I think the first meeting is next week, not tomorrow. Good. Thank you. I, uh, I had not seen it. I'll go look for it. Thank you. Joanna Bloom, that's her name. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, everybody enjoy Take your recess. <laughs> break planning board. Thanks for uh, doing a great job again, staff, uh, Gene, at tonight's meeting. And I'll gavel us out. Thanks, everybody. Hi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.